The online dating scene was still pretty new and fairly unregulated. I've been single for like five years. I lived on Long Island forever. All of a sudden I'm in Brooklyn, I move, and everyone's like, oh, what are you doing? Do you want to hang out? I thought you'd want to hang out. You know, it's like, no, I can't hang out. I'm in Brooklyn. You know, I moved here to find a husband. <laughs> Numerous calls come into 911 stating that someone's been struck by a vehicle on the Bell Parkway. Those last seconds of his life were seconds that he didn't deserve. I was just shocked. Just kind of go through this point of disbelief. It was Michael saying it could have been anyone. They, they weren't looking for a black man. They weren't looking for a white man. They were looking for a victim. You can feel how he must have felt when he saw these guys coming down and then running for his life. Imagine the sheer terror that he was probably feeling. This guy was lured to his death. We had a rogue device on this wireless network. So the idea was, all right, well, where are they? Kind of just feel your whole body collapse in that moment. It takes your breath away. July 2006, Brooklyn, New York. 28-year-old Michael Sandy is on top of the world. He's just landed a job as a designer for Ikea and is finally pursuing his dreams in the big city. This is my new apartment. This is my first apartment in New York City. <laughs> and his best friend Patrick is by his side. Michael was really excited about his first Brooklyn apartment. I mean, he was all joy. He had a laugh that could, like, carry a room. <laughs> I think it's cool. Well, it's a wrap. We finished the bed. Made much more space out of this tiny little room. It's wonderful. I'm glad my hair has changed. It's Robin. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I mean, what did we look like there, right? We were just absolute best friends. Um comfortable really comfortable with each other he was that friend that would like do anything for you loyal sensitive compassionate and those people don't come around very often life hasn't always been easy for michael growing up as a young gay black man in conservative bellport new york his struggle with being gay in long island was definitely a thing some parts of it was because he wasn't necessarily, like, out to his parents. But I think that they all had this beautiful kind of unspoken understanding. I've known Michael Sandy since we were kids. And Michael spoke very closely with his friends about who he wanted to make connections with. And being in a small town, a conservative town, and a conservative family... These things were kind of hard to explore. He wanted to work in Brooklyn, live in Brooklyn, breathe Brooklyn. So I think what was very attractive to him was really that social element and to really find a connection, to find love. I feel like he had to make that move to survive and to express who he was and to be who he was meant to be. Michael is now living his dream in hip Williamsburg, Brooklyn, an artsy neighborhood just a quick subway ride from Manhattan. So Michael is very agile, and he made everything he did look very easy. Okay. Yeah, that was great, but he was a very natural dancer. So that was... Michael dancing in a parking garage. Actually, I was filming this. We were one and two and three and punch and, you know, turn and spin. So we had it all choreographed. You know, it's tough to kind of think about the last time you see someone. But it was a good last in-person memory. Um, 
as much as he was so gregarious and outgoing, personally, he was very shy. He had never dated anyone in 11 years of me knowing him, never had a boyfriend. He was on the hunt to find love. In the early fall of 2006, just a few months after moving to Brooklyn, Michael goes out with Patrick and a small group of friends. Another friend captures a lighthearted moment on video. I've been single for like five years. I lived on Long Island forever. No one ever wants to take me to dinner. No one to ever go out. All of a sudden, I'm in Brooklyn. I move, and everyone's like, oh, what are you doing? Do you want to hang out? I thought you'd want to hang out. You know, it's like, no, I can't hang out. I'm in Brooklyn. What happened five years ago? <laughs> right? It's insane. You know, I moved here to find a husband. Let me stop. The last time I hung out with Michael was very close to the time that he had died. So. On the evening of October 8th, 2006, numerous calls come in to 911 stating that someone's been struck by a vehicle on the Bell Parkway. It's 10 p.m., and the scene is a dark section of the highway near Sheep's Head Bay, Brooklyn, in an area known as Plum Beach. That car never stopped. It was a hit and run. Very serious car accident. From injuries, he's unconscious. The victim, a young black male gravely injured but still clinging to life, is rushed to Brookdale Hospital. We have a victim. We don't know who he is. We don't know necessarily how he got there. Now we have to figure out why this occurred. Investigators question witnesses at the scene. This incident occurs at night when it's dark and everyone's vision is limited. No one really has a good description of the vehicle and or the license plate. Police search the area and soon make a crucial discovery. They come across a vehicle that's parked in a parking lot across the highway. The car was still running. Police recover a photo ID from the vehicle. It's an unmistakable match with the man gravely injured on the parkway. And through the documentation that they find, they come to find out that this vehicle is owned by a young man by the name of Michael Sandy. So we have a victim. We know his address. And we wanted to know why he would have driven from Williamsburg to the other side of Brooklyn at night in the dark. Plum Beach is just a dead stretch of sand, kind of a weeded beach where nobody really takes the sun. And it's just a quiet little stretch of beach. So something's not adding up here. What's, what's going on? Later that night, some eyewitnesses reveal a disturbing detail. So some of the accounts that the officers are getting are stating that this young black male is being chased by a number of white males from the parking lot along the Bell Parkway and then being struck by a vehicle as he's being chased. So based on witness accounts, these young men now start to pull him off the highway. His body got dragged back to the side of the road. They rifled through his pockets before running off. And witnesses saw that. Given the races that people are specifically noting, we're wondering, is this something racially motivated? You know, this may have been a targeted attack. A new detail about Michael's final moments comes to light. The computer logged into America Online, and a conversation was visible uh, on the screen. The more police learn, the more personal and tragic the case becomes. It all is a thing to me that stems from his willingness and wanting connection. He left pointers, he left the breadcrumbs. And like that, I'll see you in 20 minutes, was his final moment as he walked out the door. (laughs) 
Eyewitnesses tell police they saw Michael Sandy being chased by several unidentified white men alongside a New York City highway before he was struck by a hit-and-run driver. Hours later, in the early morning, Michael lies in a coma at Brookdale Hospital in Brooklyn. He's unconscious, so he can't speak to us to tell us how this all went down. Meanwhile, word of the shocking incident is slowly spreading among Michael's loved ones. I got a phone call, and I don't believe anyone knew the full details. I didn't really receive any information other than the fact that he was in the hospital on life support. One of my good friends called and he said Michael was in a pretty severe accident. Like I just felt my whole body fall to the ground hearing that. Then you started seeing it on the news. I was working as your reporter for the New York Post when this happened. We were told that he was still alive, he was in critical condition, and he was unable to communicate to police exactly what happened. We're talking to the family, kind of getting a clearer picture as to who Michael is. Yeah, they find out that Michael is 28, soon to be 29-year-old male, and he was an interior designer, and was just a super nice guy. Probably had zero enemies. We want to, to try to figure out why he may have suddenly find himself in a conflict with other people. When I was at the hospital, his parents were just desperately trying to find any resource and help that they could. It wasn't until I spoke with Mr. and Mrs. Sandy to really know the severity of the impact they were holding up. They had wonderful support with their family but it was hard to see them hurting the way that they were. We were able to see him, and he looked rough. I mean, his head was completely swollen. And, you know, being on life support, there was very little kind of hope in the outcome. And I was just shocked. Yeah, you just kind of go through this point of disbelief. All the machines beeping and blaring and all the hustle and bustle in the hospital to begin with, it was, it was hard to fully absorb what was happening. But it was tough to see him in that position. Feels like a dream happening. Very bad dream. Um, Detectives have little to explain the attack on Michael, other than the vague possibility it was racially motivated. So they head to Michael's apartment in Williamsburg, hoping his roommates can shed some light on his plans that evening. So the investigators are now looking to interview his roommates. Want to find out if he has any problems. Did he have a beef with somebody? Was he looking to settle a score? You know, we need to figure out why he may have gone from Williamsburg to Chiefs Head Bay and to see maybe is there any conflict that was occurring that evening. His roommates don't recall anything out of the ordinary that evening, but they mention that they saw Michael chatting on the internet earlier in the night. They chalk it up to some innocent online dating. We are hearing from Michael Sandy's roommates that he is single. And like many people were doing when this whole online dating thing was starting to really take hold, he was going out and talking to people online and, and going out to meet them. The internet really emerged when we were young adults. And this is one way where we could connect to people of our age and have that social interaction, even if it was a digital form of connection. So back in 2006, the online dating scene was still pretty new and fairly unregulated. So you were talking to people online and not really knowing who was on the other end. Now investigators begin to question if race had anything to do with the crime or whether Michael's innocent search for love online may have led him down a dangerous path. Every new thing has its benefits and its drawbacks. 
And we had seen, certainly by 2006, that the online environment was one that was being used pretty heavily by gay men in particular. And one of the drawbacks of the internet and online dating is that people will use them as avenues to target others. So now we potentially want to look at Michael Sandy's computer to see if that is going to give us any investigative evidence to corroborate that. Investigators find Michael's laptop in his bedroom. Now we start to shift their attention to, did Michael Sandy maybe talk to somebody online and went to go meet them? And maybe that scenario went wrong. To explore the possibility that a crime may have originated on the internet, investigators reach out to computer specialist Denise Dragos. The New York City Police Department had one of the very first computer crime units in the country. It was called CIT back in those days, Computer Investigation and Technology Unit. Eventually, it uh, became the Computer Crime Squad. The Detective Squad, they needed assistance to actually handle the laptop as evidence and preserve what was visible on the screen and whatever else may be on that computer. So um, I got my, my kit together, which we would bring out to digital crime scenes hard drives, USB drives, other tools potentially that may come in handy, and we responded. The computer was logged into America Online, and a conversation was visible on the screen. City police believe a computer chat may have lured Michael Sandy into an attack as Michael lays gravely injured in the hospital. NYPD computer specialist Denise Dragos discovers that Michael's computer is still logged into a chat room on America Online. The chat conversation happened the evening of the 8th. Before the incident, basically it's two users, Fisheye Fox. And a second account, which went by the screen name Drum and Bass 007, which is Michael's account. They're having a conversation. They're talking about potentially smoking marijuana together. And, you know, they, they say how old each of them are, what they look like. So in the initial conversation that Michael Sandy's having with this fish-eyed fox, they agree to meet up. They talk about meeting up in Plum Beach, Brooklyn, which is where he is struck by a vehicle. They make plans to meet there at 8 o'clock, but it's clear that things didn't go as planned. So searching through Michael's AOL chat history, when they meet up, fish Eyed Fox is not alone. There are other people around, which makes Michael Sandy feel uneasy. So he gets spooked, and he leaves. By 8.45, Michael returns to the chat from his apartment in Williamsburg. He goes back to his computer, and fish Eyed Fox is saying, you know, hey, what happened to you, and why'd you leave? And Michael Sandy says, well, I thought we were meeting one-on-one, -on -one, and there were other people around, so it just felt weird, so I left. And now Fish Eye Fox is trying to convince him, oh, yeah, I don't know who those guys were. Or, you know, we can just meet one-on-one. -on -one. It'll just be the two of us. So come on back out and we'll meet up again. By 10 o'clock, Michael is found by the side of the parkway just yards from the Plum Beach parking lot. It all is a thing to me that stems from his willingness and wanting connection like so much went out of his brain for that possibility and the real hard part is that he just didn't listen to his instincts that day and he went back looking back got the impression that he might have had an idea of what he was doing was potentially risky. I don't think it was an accident that he left his computer on with the chat window open. He left pointers, he left the breadcrumbs. And like that, I'll see you in 20 minutes was his final moments. 
as he walked out the door. Police now believe this online chat between Michael and Fisheye Fox is a key piece of evidence, and they're hoping it may lead them to a suspect. We started doing live system analysis at the time just to preserve the information that was there, so even without touching it, did little old school to pictures, traditional pictures of it, just to make sure that even if it crashed, at least we had that. We were running special software on the machines, which copied out all of the system memory to an external drive. So that in that case, we were able to get a lot of information and preserve it forensically in real time. For investigators, it's now imperative that they track down the man Michael was chatting with, who goes by the screen name Fisheye Fox. But due to privacy laws, that will require a court order. You have to remember back in 2006, the internet was a very different place. Some of these social media companies were not necessarily forthcoming with information about their clients. We started doing the process to subpoena America Online to see who owns this Fisheye Fox account, if we could you know, identify that person. On October 9th, a day after Michael Sandy was struck on the Belt Parkway, the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office issues a subpoena to America Online to disclose the name of the individual who goes by the chat handle Fisheye Fox. So in the investigation, we come to find out that Fisheye Fox is a screen name that is owned by someone by the name of John Fox, who has an IP address that comes back to Brooklyn. And thus, the investigators now go to that address in Brooklyn where the ping of this IP address is coming back to. The address on Brigham Street is just a few blocks from Plum Beach in Sheep's Head Bay, Brooklyn, where Michael was struck. It was a row houses on this block on Brigham Street. We pretty much set up a surveillance uh, operation with you know, numerous detectives in different cars. And as you know, all the teams are sitting there, somebody shows up at that house and walks up to the front gate. All of the police cars, you know, come screeching up and, you know, the detectives jump out and approach the individual. We identified ourselves as being detectives, NYPD. And he says, what's going on, guys? NYPD detectives have tracked the source of a computer chat room message they believe was used to lure Michael Sandy to a vicious attack. Based on the IP address linked to the message, they descend on a house in Brooklyn. The gentleman lived at that address. He said, I just got off work. You know, can I help you guys? So we asked him his name. The chat room message was from a user called Fisheye Fox who police have identified as John Fox. But that is not the man's name. And there's no one named John Fox who lives at his address. So that was a little bit of a, a pucker moment. You know, are you, oh crap? He asked, do you have internet service? He was, yeah, as a matter of fact, you know, I just got a new router. So we're like, all right, can we come inside and talk to you about a situation? He says, yeah, you know, come on inside. As soon as we walk into the kitchen, right there on the kitchen table, we can see a brand new wireless router. So new that no security has been set up on it yet. Detective Dragos realizes that means anyone could have tapped into this internet service. And a quick check reveals her theory to be correct. It appeared that now we had a rogue device on this wireless network. The homeowner just had a new router and it wasn't secured and was logged into surreptitiously by this Fisheye Fox user. Detective Dragos knows that if the rogue device is logged into this router, it must be close by, within range of the Wi-Fi signal. All right, well, where are they? They have to be within a stone's throw. So let's try and figure out where they are right now. 
So I'm like, I can try to talk to them and stir the pot and see what happens. So I have an undercover account and I'm like, hey, what's up? It was just a shot in the dark to see, you know, if, if I could figure out where the heck this computer was. I get a response from Fisheye Fox. So now I'm talking to Fisheye Fox myself. And so I'm like, hey, what's going on? How you been? When are we getting together? And he's, ah, uh, you know, I'm back at school. So we're confounded right now. Detective Dragos reaches out to her contact at America Online, who is able to determine that John Fox, a.k.a. Fisheye Fox, is now chatting from a different location entirely. And we're like, well, what's this other location? And they said it goes back to SUNY Maritime, which is State University of New York Maritime College, which was a college, you know, in, in the Bronx. A check with the campus security office reveals there is a sophomore enrolled at SUNY Maritime named John Fox. It was after midnight, I'm sure, at that point. And basically, we all responded in a caravan from that location. Everybody drove out to the Bronx to go and talk to John Fox. The investigators coordinate with SUNY campus police to locate John Fox's dorm room. It's 1 a.m. in the morning, and now you're going to talk to someone whose part in this whole thing is still unclear. We do know that John Fox is connected to the screen name that Michael Sandy was talking to. So everyone's antennas are up. When the 19-year-old student comes to the door, he appears surprised, but his demeanor is calm. So the investigators are now talking to John Fox at his dorm, and they're asking him, what was your weekend like? And he proceeds to tell them, well, I was just hanging out with some friends, and we were just drinking some beers, just chilling out for the weekend, just a few friends having a good time. During this interview, John Fox starts to get nervous and his answers start to contradict themselves. This is going from an interview turning into an interrogation. John Fox agrees to accompany the detectives to the 61st Precinct in Brooklyn. John Fox is saying in his statement that he and Anthony Fortunato and Gary Timmons and the Russian kid, Alex, are hanging out by a local deli, they decide to go back to the house where John Fox logs into the computer. And he admits that fish Eyed Fox is his screen name, but that his friends must have been using his screen name to have a conversation because he knew nothing about this conversation. But then he starts to turn around and say, well, you know, we were just looking to have a little fun. What does that mean? What does it mean that we're looking to have a little fun? And he starts to basically incriminate himself. And he claims Anthony Fortunato is the one who sort of hatched this scheme to go into a gay chat room, talk with someone who's looking to meet up with another man, and then meet up with that person to rob them under the assumption that the gay man won't go to the police. The reality that some folks actually feel a certain amount of shame, and so they would be less likely to report. They would be less likely to make a complaint. It's a very powerful set of facts. There was something particularly chilling about how this man was lured out to his death, basically. Could have been anyone. They, they weren't looking for a black man. They weren't looking for a white man. They were looking for a victim. And unfortunately, they chose Michael Sandy. John Fox admits to NYPD detectives that he, Anthony Fortunato, and a group of their friends used the screen name Fisheye Fox in a chat room 
to set up a meeting with Michael Sandy under the guise of a date with the intention of robbing him. So they met on the street. John Fox and him had a brief conversation and Fortunato and then a couple of their other friends actually were in the area. So Michael got spooked. You know, his spidey sense was tingling. He left. All was good. Detectives believe that while Michael returned home, John Fox and his friends didn't want to give up. They start drinking beers again and they say, oh, maybe we can find somebody else. You know, in the interim, Michael reaches back out. I said, hey, I just want to hang out with you. I don't want to do a group thing. So let's just me and you hang out. So John was like, all right, cool. We'll do that. So he came back. They all get to Plum Beach, and they approach a blue Mazda, which is Michael Sandy's car. Alex starts to assault Michael Sandy. Michael Sandy breaks away from the assault, and they start to chase him. Where was he going to go? If they were going to prevent him from getting into his car, he's going onto the highway. Imagine the sheer terror that he was probably feeling when he's chased onto a busy highway running for his life and running into a speeding vehicle. Those last seconds of his life were seconds that he didn't deserve. That car takes off, never stops. And then the men, they drag him to the side of the road. One of them goes into his pockets, empties everything, and they take off. John Fox he says they all fled the scene and then they all went back to the house and they were all shaken up by this whole scenario. It's almost like classic stupid kids, but there's a, there was a coldness about it as well. Police begin to investigate the friends John Fox says took part in the scheme. And when they learn the home address of Anthony Fortunato, the pieces of the puzzle start to come together. Fortunato's house is next door to the Brooklyn home the detectives visited the night before, where a rogue computer was logged into the Wi-Fi. So they go to Anthony Fortunato's house to talk to him, and he claims, yeah, I'll come talk to you. I'm just going to get a lawyer, and I'll come down to the station to talk to you guys. But Fortunato never shows up at the precinct, as promised. Then suddenly we get a call from his mother stating that, well, Anthony can't come talk to you because he's in the hospital. He tried to kill himself. <sighs> However, John Fox has implicated two other people, Gary Timmons and this other kid known as the Russian kid, Alex. So the investigators looking through MySpace with the information given to them by John Fox find out Russian kid's true identity is now revealed by someone by the name of Ilya Shurov. So now investigators can go talk to them. Fox, Timmons, and Shirov all confess to their roles in the attack, pointing to Fortunato as the mastermind of the plan. Meanwhile, at Brookdale Hospital, Michael Sandy's family is facing a terrible choice. So Michael Sandy's in the hospital unconscious. He's dying. He's not going to recover. The doctors know this. The doctors make the family aware of this. And he will never be the person that he was. On October 12th, Michael Sandy spends his 29th birthday with his family holding vigil in his ICU room. They know they are spending their final moments with him. They wanted to wait so that he didn't die on his birthday. So the day after his 29th birthday, his family made that awful, awful decision. I received a call from Mrs. Sandy and said, you know, we took Michael off life support. Always thinking that this can't be true, but 
you know, these these emotions just kind of come over you. And I'm still trying to process it. Um, but, you know, you kind of go through those moments when you can and be supportive for the family. But you kind of just feel your whole body collapse in that moment. It literally takes your breath away, you know, in that moment. And, um, need to let him go. You feel robbed. You know, you really... Especially when it comes with an act that has such malice for anything of joy and life and love. Investigators now have statements from three of their suspects, but they still can't speak with Anthony Fortunato, the alleged mastermind of the scheme, who remains hospitalized after his suicide attempt. While they wait for his condition to improve, they execute a search warrant at his home. We go back out to the location and when law enforcement gets there, they said, all right, you're looking for computers. Here's our computer. This is the only computer we have. But we're able to actually look at the computer and immediately say, no, that's not the computer we're looking for. Because, you know, it is mapped to the manufacturer. And in this case, we knew we were looking for a Dell computer. The computer that they happened to like pull out of a hat and, and say was the only computer in the house was not a Dell. So we were like, no, try again. And they didn't have any other computers that they were willing to voluntarily turn over. So a search of the residence commenced as, as authorized by the search warrant. Hidden in the basement was a Dell laptop. That was the computer that was connected to the IP address that was connected to Fishai Fox during the crime. So we knew we found what we were looking for. It basically was the smoking gun. By the time Fortunato is released from the hospital, Kings County prosecutors are prepared to act. They now have everything they need to file charges of attempted robbery and manslaughter but they're also considering a unique enhancement to the charges that's rarely been tried before. This was a real social problem that people were being targeted as victims of a crime because they belonged to, to certain groups. And in this case, they were looking to select a gay person, and that's what they did. That is the element that establishes the hate crime. Four men are facing charges in the attack that killed Michael Sandy. And prosecutors are prepared to also try them on a rare and untested set of charges. This was one of the first cases I can recall clearly where the hate crimes enhancement was actually used in New York State for an anti-gay murder. And I think it was important for the community, for this to be called what it was. It had a lot of meaning for people. On October 25th, 2006, John Fox, Ilya Shurov, and Anthony Fortunato are indicted on charges of second degree murder, attempted robbery, and manslaughter as a hate crime. That same day, Gary Timmons, who was a minor at the time of the crime, pleads guilty to attempted robbery in the second degree. You want to make sure that when a case is tried as a hate crime, it has to specifically plug into the statutes of the hate crimes law. And the sentence that is usually handed down is a much heavier sentence. But as the date of trial approaches in October 2007, nearly a year to the day from the attack on Michael at Plum Beach, Anthony Fortunato's attorney mounts a stunning defense to the hate crime charges. Fortunato tried to pull a rabbit out of the hat and said it can't be a hate crime because he came out of the closet himself. 
he identified himself as being a gay man and said that because he's gay, it can't be a hate crime because you can't hate gay people if you're gay also. It was an extremely flimsy defense legally because hate is not an aspect of the crime itself. That's not something that the prosecution has to establish in order to establish somebody's guilt of a hate crime. He could have mixed motives, but it doesn't get him off the hook. From the get-go, the whole plan was based on targeting a gay person. John Fox and Anthony Fortunato are acquitted of murder, but convicted of manslaughter and attempted robbery as hate crimes, receiving sentences of 7 to 21 years. A month later, Ilya Shurov pleads guilty to the same charges and receives a sentence of 17 and a half years. Gary Timmons, who testifies as a prosecution witness, receives a four-year sentence. When they were found guilty, it was a natural release to have some vindication, but I don't know about the justice part. I absolutely cannot say as to whether or not justice was served in this case. Maybe it's for Michael's parents to answer that question, for Michael's solar spirit to answer that question, even in an odd way for his perpetrators to answer that question. Because I would have a hard time feeling that justice were served if they did not come to understand the gravity and tragedy of what they did. This case sort of impacted me on a personal level. It was back in 2006, I was a single gay man on the internet, talking to people and meeting up with people. For all practical purposes, I could have been Michael Sandy. Michael Sandy's closest friends are left with nothing now, except their memories, and a few artifacts of his last days, like this video from the fall of 2006, when he enjoyed a final evening out in Brooklyn with his friends. Can I put my glasses on? I've been a single for five years. I lived on Long Island forever. No one ever wanted to take me to dinner. No one to ever go out. You know, I moved here to find a husband. <laughs> that is too much. Um, you heard his laugh. You know, I moved here to find a husband. <laughs> <laughs> He was a wonderful human being from head to toe. Wonderful. Okay, it's rocking. He exudes this wonderful light that shines and that magical laughter and smiles. And he, he loved life to the fullest. They were very loving people. They wanted to share all their love with as many children as they could. You got these two individuals killed execution style. It's shocking that someone would be shot right in front of their own kids in their own home. What did you think when you heard that pow, 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 pow? I thought, oh dear God, no. They had 16 cameras, and they were all working. You see them kicking the front door, back door, at the same time. It just doesn't make sense because they got what they wanted, so why kill them? The camera really tells the tale. 
it was almost silence when we were watching it and seeing it. We, we couldn't believe what we were watching. Summer 2009, Pensacola, Florida. Bud and Melanie Billings are enjoying life with the big loving family they've made for themselves. They had a couple of their own children and they adopted many children. They just wanted to have a large family whatever way they could swing it. I believe they're the modern life Brady Bunch, honestly. They adopted a lot of special needs kids and they loved them a lot. If they could, they would adopt every child in the world. Before the Billings became Pensacola's modern day Brady Bunch, they were just Bud and Melanie. Bud was a fixture in the used car business. So Bud is this hard-charging businessman. He was an entrepreneur. He had many businesses. He had a lot of money. And he wanted a large family. The bigger, the better. Then he meets Melanie, who is the softer side of him. Bud used to own a club in town. Melanie was a waitress there. And uh, they badly fell in love. He eventually sold the club and got heavier in the used car business, which is where Bud really was making his money. With Bud's career on the rise, the couple decide to marry in 1993. Melanie was great. She kind of smoothed off the edges of Bud. He deeply loved her. Bud and Melanie have two children apiece from previous marriages but they're not done yet. He wanted to take care of children and it was like in his soul. So adoptions ensued. And Bud and Melanie actually ended up with 13 children. Melanie developed a passion for helping these kids. And these kids were very much a part of their lives. They just were very loving people, honestly. They just wanted to share all their love with as many children as they could. You have money and you are adopting these special needs children and that gains a lot of attention because of, you know, it's a good deed obviously, but also it's kind of unusual. By 2009, the Billings have nine children in their home ranging in age from four to 11. Their two oldest children from previous marriages, Melanie's daughter, Ashley, and Bud's son, Justin, are grown but live in the area. They decide to share the story of their big loving family with their community. Our daily newspaper did a big profile on the Billings family. There were some wonderful pictures of Bud and Melanie and all this, this litter of, of kids, uh, some you know, laying and some in their laps and all ages and sizes. And the whole story was just about how big their hearts were. This photo was the last photo of the family. And just, you know, you can't look at that picture and not feel something for this family. At 7 p.m. on July 9th, 2009, the Billings are home. Most of their children are in bed. Bud is with one of their kids watching television. His wife is in a kitchen. Uh, it was one of those kitchens that had sort of a, a counter that she could look into the living room area. So she's cleaning dishes. They're watching TV. Bud and Melanie Billings have no idea that these seemingly mundane chores will be their final moments together.
their eldest daughter, Ashley, calls the house to see how the family's doing. It's like 7.30 at night. One of the children answers the phone, and the child is crying. The Billings had a nurse that helped part-time at the home. Her name was April Spencer. Worried that she can't get her parents to come to the phone, Ashley calls April and asks her to go to the Billings' house and check on Bud and Melanie and their children. Sheriff's sure partner, Stevie. I live next door. The mother and father have been shot. They've been shot? Yes. Please come. Kim, I'm trying to get somebody this, but you said the mother and father both have been shot? Yes. I got to go over here with these children, but I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want you to be in any danger, okay? I've got several officers on the way to okay, you. Hurry. I got to go get the kids. It's kitchen now. Home security video reveals a key clue to the Billings killers. The first thing that comes to mind when you see that red van is, we're going to be able to find that. And find a tangled web of conspirators. They're all in complete black. They look like ninjas. She's very successful, and somehow she's involved with these ninja characters. So now we're stuck with trying to figure out all these players and how to prove it. And it doesn't make any sense. Why would you get yourself involved in this? Police said the mother and father both have been shot. July 9th, 2009. A frantic 911 call sends police rushing to the home of Bud and Melanie Billings in Pensacola, Florida. We got dispatch telling us that we needed to respond to a double murder. At that time, we didn't know much about it. We didn't know if maybe it was a murder-suicide or what we had. I pull up, and I see probably half of our patrol deputies on scene, lights everywhere. It was sort of surreal because and they're carrying babies and, and toddlers and all different type of ages outside. Just that, that eeriness of how many kids were in that house and trying to get them out. There's eight to 13 kids that we're dealing with. We learn right away, the majority of them were nonverbal. It was difficult getting anything out of them. So after the kids were safe with the nanny, we started to walk through the crime scene. Uh, right away, you notice the door been kicked in, that it was forced open. You see some blood right there in the living room. Um, and then to the far right is the bedroom. And you see Mr. and Miss Billings on the floor inside the bedroom. Based on the initial forensics noted at the scene, it quickly becomes clear to detectives that this is not a murder-suicide. You know, you've got these two individuals killed almost execution style. When you see that, that's when we knew it's definitely, this is going to be different. I mean, you know right away that you're dealing with either robbery or home invasion, something in that nature. When the Billings' daughter, Ashley, arrives at the scene, she points officers to something inside the house that could help them get some answers. There were cameras all over the place. They had 16 cameras, and they were all working. The reason they had the video system there was to keep an eye on all these special needs kids if they didn't hurt themselves. Detectives rush the video equipment back to their tech team at headquarters, hopeful it will hold the answers to what happened in Bud and Melanie's final moments. We had to actually pull the hard drive 
It had to be pulled and brought back to the sheriff's office to be viewed. Meanwhile, forensics teams continue through the night processing the bloody scene for physical evidence. There wasn't a lot of evidence left by these killers because um, they really covered their tracks except for the shell casings. But then also, there were some shoe prints because one of the doors had been kicked in and they found some boot prints outside the house. Investigators send the physical evidence for processing and return to the sheriff's office, where they are at last able to access the video from the Billings home security system. When we finally start viewing the video, it's clear as day, you see this red van pull up. You see these people jump out. We had five individuals moving across the yard, but they're all in complete black, black shoes, shirts, uh, and mask. So it, they look like ninjas. It was almost silence when we were watching it. We, we couldn't believe what we were watching. Then you see him kick in the front door, back door, at the same time. It's not something that we had ever seen. The surveillance footage tells a stunning story about what happened inside the house. You can tell it's obviously planned, military style, long guns, handguns. You see Bud immediately puts his hands up. And he's trying to talk to these killers that have come into his home with his kids and his wife. Then you have two other masked men come in from down the hallway. So the men that finally rush into the room, they get Bud and they zip tie him and they push him to the floor. Within minutes of getting Bud on the floor, one of the guys shoots him twice, one in each leg. In the meaty part of, of the calf. Drag him, you know, into the master bedroom, drag Melanie into the master bedroom. Mr. Billings didn't have video in his bedroom. So we didn't see them being killed. Investigators rewind the video again and again, scouring it for clues. And they spot something they didn't notice earlier. We see there's a little boy in the living room. This little six, seven, eight-year-old kid watching and seeing his family get killed. It was horrible. The child, he was with his dad when the men broke into the house. He wasn't in the bedroom, but he actually saw his dad being shot. He saw his mom being dragged. The gang pretty much just ignored him, you know, while this was all going on. And immediately, you know, just kept doing what they were doing. I've covered a lot of murders, and this one is the most shocking because it's basically caught on camera, memorializing the final moments of the Billings' lives. And all the children are there. It's so unnerving, and it's just sad, but also it's something you can't unsee. And then after that, you can see the ninja invaders quickly leaving the house. You see them getting into the van with an object. But it was hard to tell from the video what they were carrying out of the house. This whole thing happened in less than 10 minutes. So police are trying to figure out, is this just simply a home invasion and people that want money? Or why did this go down?
home security video has captured chilling details of the murders of Bud and Melanie Billings in front of their children. Investigators believe the key to understanding what happened may lie in the unidentified object the killers are seen fleeing with on the blurry video. In the early moments of the investigation, we were thinking that it was a robbery. The video answers a lot of questions, but not the most important ones. So you have this great video of showing exactly what happened, but you couldn't distinguish any type of facial features or anything like that. And we didn't know what they took. Investigators continue trying to decipher the clues contained in the home security video. They need to know exactly what was taken from the Billings home, why, and most importantly, by whom. So they speak to those closest to Bud and Melanie, their oldest children, Justin and Ashley. Typically in a homicide, they're gonna go first to the people that are closest. So they're gonna go find out where all the family members were, get their interviews done quickly. We found out through Ashley, there was two different safes in the house. The small safe was in his bedroom in a bedroom closet. And there's another safe upstairs. And one of those safes is now missing. So when we put the whole thing together, you see him carrying what we know now is the small safe put into the red van, and you see everybody leaving. In that safe, Ashley had told us there's like birth certificates, adoption paperwork, stuff of that nature for all these kids. Some minor jewelry of her mom's, but not a lot. So Ashley tells police, look, they got away with a safe, but the other safe that's in the house is the one with the cash. There was a lot of money being made with the used car business. So in the safe upstairs, there was like hundred to 200,000, something like that worth of cash inside. They took the wrong one. They had no clue about the second safe. And I just think it was a, a, a little bit of ignorance. Investigators still have no leads to the identities of the home invaders. They hope one comes from their most promising clue, the red van seen on the security video. The first thing that comes to mind when you see that red van is, we're gonna be able to find that. We got that video of the red van put out on media. I mean, right away. As police work on finding the killers, the Billings family is faced with another urgent task, taking care of the children who are now left orphaned. Ashley, Melanie's oldest daughter from her previous marriage, rises to the challenge. She's taking care of all the kids. That's a big responsibility, but those kids need someone that's close to them and that knows what they need. Days pass with no new leads on the red van or the identity of its occupants. The evidence points to a robbery gone bad. But with a safe full of cash left behind and the two brazen murders, detectives begin to wonder if something bigger is at play. In the South, you don't speak ill of the dead until they're buried. So my thought was, okay, once we get the funerals over with, somebody's gonna come forward. And sure enough, my theory turned out to be right. We started hearing that Bud was a great friend, but he never got the wrong side of a business deal. The stories that we were getting were that people that had used car lots with them, he would find a successful salesperson, he would help them finance the cars, but then when the sales start to fall off, he didn't hesitate to take the whole lot from them. 
And there were stories of him coming in in the middle of the night, taking all the keys, moving all the cars in the lot, and the guy going back to work to a lot he thought he had with no cars. Might Bud Billings have crossed the wrong man? So there was a question whether this was just purely to burglarize the Billings or was there some other motive behind this? Was it hit? Was there a, a revenge motive to this? We appreciate you coming in. Well, anything to help. Bud's adult son, Justin, sometimes worked with his dad on his auto lots. As police interview him about the murders, he provides some intriguing details about his father's business dealings. And when the police spoke to Justin, he gave them a name, a key to why this might have all gone down. During the interview with Justin, he brings up Cab Tice. He said, hey, this is a guy you might want to look at. Him and my dad have had issues in the past. And you might want to check him out. Cab Tice ran several car dealerships. He had a flair for liking Hawaiian shirts. He tanned. Justin tells investigators that his father had a business dispute with Cab Tice. And Bud had accused Cab of stealing from him. My dad was disappointed in him for stealing from him. I mean, he said if you needed money, you could have just asked. You'd have to steal it from me. And Cab just stormed out. So we start looking in the cab ties. We wind up going out there and making contact with Cab. And he made it clear that he had no use for Mr. Billings. It kept just getting more interesting in every turn. Two days after the murders of Bud and Melanie Billings, Bud's son, Justin, has given police the name of a potential suspect, Cab Tice. The story was he and Bud had a falling out. Bud would finance his lot, and Cab would sell cars and not give Bud his share of the money. If anybody had something against Bud Billings, it was Cab Tice. Mr. Billings felt like Cab owed him money. They were not friendly at all. It was clear. So when we started to talk to Mr. Tice, he was very frank. In business, Bud Billings wouldn't give you a dime unless you got 29 cents back. Said, hey, I don't like the guy. I have no use for him. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm not sad that he's gone. Bud Billings' favorite statement was this, and if, as you interview people, they'll all confirm this. He'll say, you know what? Over these years, I had so much cash that I could not spend it before I died. And when this whole thing happened, those words rang in my ear, I have more cash, and I, and I think it was right. Detectives think Cab Tice could have a motive to go after Bud. They press him to provide an alibi for the night of the murders. And he tells them he was working at a dealership an hour and a half outside of Pensacola that evening. And we showed you a picture of this man right here, right? Yes, sir. I've never seen that man. You've never seen that man? No, sir. With no evidence that he committed any crime, police have no cause to hold Cab. We let him go, letting him know that we had to follow up, checking his alibi and verify everything that he said. Despite their initial suspicions, detectives are able to corroborate Cab's alibi. The case seems to be losing momentum. But then... Investigators' strategy of asking for the public's help finding the red van seen at the Billings' home finally pays off. Somebody calls up and says, hey, I know this van. I once owned it, and I sold it. And I sold it to Patrick Gonzalez. (laughs) 
investigators go to the address of Mr. Gonzalez they had found in our computer database. They drive by the house. They, lo and behold, there's this van peeking out behind the trailer. They go, and it looks like the one that is in the video. And then it's just sitting there. So please bring Patrick Gonzalez to the police station for questioning. So he tells the investigator that the van doesn't run, hasn't moved in a while, and that it's his son's. Gonzalez Juniors. So police have two suspects, and they both have the same name. One is Senior, one is Junior. Leonard Patrick Gonzalez Senior, and then Leonard Patrick Gonzalez Junior. Detectives continue to press Patrick Gonzalez Senior about the red van, when suddenly he crumbles. Patrick Gonzalez Senior tells the police that, hey, I was just the driver. He spilled the beans on everything. Okay. You pull in the driveway, what happens? Everybody jumps in, doors kicking open. Right on the ground. Okay. All right. And that's all I thought it would be. He just basically spills his guts that it's his son, Patrick Jr., who masterminded the whole thing, and it's all his fault. I was just the getaway driver. He said his son kind of brought him into this. A father and son kind of escapade. You know, instead of going fishing, we're going to go commit a robbery. He talks about, you know, being told about this being a drug dealer. That nobody was going to care if they robbed this guy. And he was shocked when he heard the gun shots go off in the house. And pretty much lays out the whole crime. You said you were you were still in the van. What did you do next? Got in the driver's seat. Uh huh. And then what happens after that? We get down in the yard. Everything's going fine, and then all of a sudden, pow, pow, pow. Okay. What'd you think when you heard that pow, 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 pow? I liked it. On myself, I thought, oh dear God, no. Based on his confession, Patrick Gonzalez Sr. is charged with being an accomplice. Sr. tells us everything that happened, but he doesn't know all the names of the other guys. So now we're stuck with trying to figure out all these players and how to prove it. Police have traced the red van used in the murders of Bud and Melanie Billings to Patrick Gonzalez Sr. He admits to being at the scene, but insists his son is the mastermind behind the deadly robbery. So as we start investigating Gonzalez Jr., we learned that he had him and Bud Billings were friends and knew each other. They knew each other in the car business. Patrick Jr. would work at different car lots. They would do these big tent sales, and he'd be one of the army of salespeople that would do that. Because of what they have on Patrick Jr. from his father, they bring him in for an interrogation. Investigators do not immediately reveal what Patrick Gonzalez's father has told them. We appreciate you coming here today. Believe me, when I saw the, the pictures on the... Uh... TV, I mean, I was like, damn, you know, and I know the guy, you know, so I'm thinking, you know, what guy? The guy that this is about. So I was like, I mean, you saw the picture of the van on TV? Yeah. Man, that's your van. Excuse me? That picture is the same van that's in your yard, right? It's similar. Similar. Huh? Very similar to that van, but no, it's not, it can't be the same van. It's not the same van. He denies everything, and he tells us his dad's mentally crazy. Don't listen to nothing, he says. Detectives believe Patrick Sr.'s story. Patrick Gonzalez Jr. is their prime suspect. But they have to find proof that he was involved. We had enough probable cause to keep Sr. 
We didn't have enough probable cause to keep Junior, so then we got to keep following up. We got to get enough evidence to prove his dad's story. That includes doing a deep dive into Patrick Jr.'s background. Patrick Jr., he had spent some time in prison uh, with a battery charge, an assault charge, and he had come out. He was very proficient in, in martial arts, he had done some MMA fighting. Patrick had gone to Bud to get money to help with the studio that he had, the martial arts studio that he started, and Bud was not interested in investing in his business. Investigators believe they have discovered a possible explanation for why the robbery turned so inexplicably deadly. Could Patrick Jr. have been so angry at Bud for not investing in his studio that he wanted him dead? Police execute a search warrant at Patrick Gonzalez Sr.'s property, where the red van was located. The search warrant at Senior's house was incredibly huge. It helps tie things together. We wind up getting paint cans where they were trying to paint the vehicle. Some burned clothes and stuff like that. We wind up getting a shoe box from Walmart. So the shoe box is significant because the pattern on the bottom of those boots match the pattern of the shoe prints found at the Billings house after the double murder. Detectives head to Walmart and find surveillance footage matching the date and time on a receipt found with the shoe boxes. And on it, they see Patrick Jr. with a group of men police believe is the robbery crew. Well, all of them are on the video at Walmart where we see him buying clothing and shoes for the group that he had recruited. Prosecutors feel they now have enough to arrest Patrick Gonzalez Jr. When they release the Walmart video to the public, tips help them identify and arrest the other five men. They were tied to Gonzalez Jr. through a mechanic shop. So he winds up talking them into going into this house and robbing it because this guy's got tons and tons of money in his safe. Police arrest Wayne Coldiron, Donnie Stallworth, Gary Sumner, Rakeem Florence, and Frederick Thornton. But pieces of the puzzle are still missing. They had arrested a lot of people, but they didn't have the guns. They didn't have the safe. Detectives continue interrogating their suspects, probing for leads to the guns and safe. And as they do, they hear about a mysterious woman who may be the key to that information. Pamela Long Wiggins, she's blonde. She's a real estate agent, very successful, has a lot of money. And somehow she's involved with these ninja characters. We wind up finding out that she's rents to Gonzalez Jr., a home in Gulf Breeze, Florida. He would collect money for her if people were giving her a hard time not paying up, kick them out of homes, stuff of that nature. So that was their uh, connection. Police learn from their suspects that after the murders, Patrick Gonzalez Jr. met with Pamela, but then she disappeared. Detectives managed to track Pamela down just in time. She was trying to leave and wound up locating her in a uh, big yacht or boat that they had in Orange Beach, Alabama. When we get Pamela on Wiggins back to the sheriff's office, she doesn't want to speak with us without an attorney. But then they get an unexpected visit from Pamela's husband, Hugh, looking to cut a deal for himself. Hugh Wiggins was not on our radar at all. So we're like, this case just gets crazier and crazier. 
and he actually spills all the beans. He sells his wife under the bus. First question we have is, where is the safe? Do you want me to tell you, or do you want me to take you to the... I want you to tell me at this point. Well, first of all, I don't know for a fact that it's there. I was just told that it wasn't there. Who, were, who told you? Pam told me. Hugh had cut uh, an immunity deal with the state attorney's office. And uh, he told them where the guns could be found, where the, where the safe was. That was sort of a turning point in this investigation. Faced with her husband's betrayal, Pamela admits to taking the guns and safe. She tells detectives she got her marching orders from Patrick Gonzalez Jr. Okay. He said, if we do the job, you know, won't be in trouble. And I let him talk me into it. I didn't hear you. And I let him talk me into doing this. Pamela Wiggins is charged with accessory after the fact. The rest of the crew are charged with murder and armed home invasion. As investigators continue to interrogate them, they all point the finger at Patrick Gonzalez Jr. as the man who turned that night deadly. Because he's the one who pulls the trigger. They explain that when they come in the front door that it's Gonzalez Jr. right away. When the first shot goes out, they're shocked. And they tell us that Gonzalez Jr. shot them both while they were in the bedroom. Gonzalez Jr. told this tale of how we're going to rob these drug dealers and this bad guy, and there's millions and millions of dollars. It was only supposed to be a robbery, and they were pissed because that is not what was supposed to happen. Prosecutors in Patrick Gonzalez Jr.'s murder case are preparing for what they know will be a closely watched trial. It's one of the most high-profile cases in Pensacola's history. I think that what was a challenge in this case was that you want to make sure that no stone goes unturned to make sure we obtain justice. It's a death penalty case. Leonard Patrick Gonzalez, Jr. Yes, sir, Otto. Mr. Gonzalez, you've been arrested on charges of uh, homicide and home invasion and robbery with a firearm. In October 2010, the trial of Patrick Gonzalez, Jr. for the murders of Bud and Melanie Billings begins. Prosecutors have plenty of evidence that he wanted the Billings' money. I think that Gonzalez, Jr., believe that there was a treasure trove at that house. But they can't explain why he wanted them dead. So the big question that still hangs in the ballast is why were the Billings killed? It just doesn't make sense because they got what they wanted. They got a safe. So why kill the parents? It was supposed to be just a simple robbery. People needing money. I really... I'm not sure what is, was in Gonzalez's mind. But I think if you watch the video and surveillance video and you see it, as quickly as he shot him when he came in that door, I think, in my opinion, he had full intentions of killing him as soon as he came in that door. He comes in the door and shoots him right away. Patrick Gonzalez won't provide any answers about his motive. He maintains his innocence and declines to testify. But the state has another powerful weapon. As part of a plea deal, two of the crew members, Rakeem Florence and Frederick Thornton, have agreed to testify to their involvement in the murders. We walked Florence and Thornton through the video. And they would say, that's me. That's this, this is this person. It became alive through them. 
So you brought almost a color commentary right there from the, the guys who were inside the house. I think it worked effectively. The video was the overwhelming piece of evidence that sealed the fate of all these folks. The video cannot be cross-examined. It puts the people where they're at. It is the crime. On October 28, 2010, the jury finds Patrick Gonzalez Jr. guilty of murder and armed home invasion robbery. A judge ultimately after sentencing hearings sentenced him to death. The other members of the deadly crew all receive heavy prison sentences, ranging from 20 years to life. Both Patrick Gonzalez Sr. and Pamela Wiggins die behind bars. As a human being, you just have to look at the senseless nature of it. Just absolutely senseless violence that has inexorably changed people's lives by virtue of just mere greed. Senseless greed. And that's the thing that really saddens you. Because, you know, in, in, in many ways, all these people were drawn in for greed, and then a senseless double murder takes place. Families are torn apart. Both sides of the equation are, are forever changed by this. Family was at the center of Bud and Melanie's life. Their daughter Ashley keeps their legacy alive by continuing to care for the children loved by the couple. I just hope that one day that the kids grow up and they know that Melanie and Bud did love them. Today was a sucky day, but at the same time, it makes me laugh so hard. I know that if he was my boyfriend and was in love with me, I know he would be amazing. I cannot wait to see him. I texted asking if she was okay, and she never texted back. I asked her friends, acquaintances, anybody, if you have seen her, contact me. By 7 o'clock in the morning, I'm in full mode panic. And then I told her, we need to go to Grand Rapids. It was like time stood still. We knew something was wrong. That's when I see blood. I'd yell at my girlfriend. Call the cops. Call the cops. I opened the bag, and there were human limbs inside that bag. I remember thinking, what kind of animal does this to a person? Autumn 2018, Kalamazoo, Michigan. 31-year-old Ashley Young is pursuing her dream of becoming a language interpreter. Ashley wanted to explore. She wanted to learn any culture. It didn't matter who you were, you know. She was going to ask you questions and ask how your day was. So let's talk about my morning and how amazing, and I promise this is none of this is exaggerated or made up. It is, you can't make this up, okay? I always told her, you can do anything, you can be anything that you want. You just need to put your mind to it. To make ends meet, 
Ashley works nights at a bank call center. She loved that job. She was helping people with their accounts if they had questions, and she could put their mind to ease. During the day, Ashley takes language classes at Kalamazoo Community College. So anyways, have a good day. I really am going to go get ready for class now, and sorry for talking a lot, but that's just me. Ashley was positive, always positive. We called her uh, sunshine. Today was a sucky day, but at the same time, it makes me laugh so hard. Ashley was always on social media. She was the light, the conscience you never knew you really needed. And the times that you were frustrated, she put it in perspective for you. Like, you know, you could have it worse. I uh, hope at least made you smile and made you realize that, you know, your day is probably going a hell of a lot better than mine. I met Christine um, in 2002. Ashley and her mom were best buddies, and I had to be that step-parent. But we made it, you know. Ashley was just lovable and joyful. I met Ashley the first day of 10th grade. We had a couple classes together, we had choir together. We'd sit in our car for hours just talking in her mom's driveway, listening to music, singing, and just being, being silly girls. And then after school, we, you know, we're still inseparable. After high school, Ashley puts her dreams of studying languages on hold. She works a series of jobs, and when she is 24 years old, she meets Moody Farhan. The two quickly fall in love, and within a couple of years, are living together. She had never really dated or been with anyone until Moody, and he was her first love. She adored him, and he adored her, and it was just like a little fairy tale. Moody loved her, and he had already, like, gave her a promise ring. They were together almost seven years. But by 31, Ashley has decided to make big changes in her life. Not only is she in school working towards her dream job, but she also decides that it's time to end her long-time relationship. She was trying to balance work and going to school, and they were both kind of just at a different point in their life. After the breakup, on November 10th, 2018, she surprises her best friend, Samantha, with a trip to Detroit. She took me to Detroit to go to a concert to go see Tosh Sultana, an artist that I love. That trip was amazing. <laughs> this is Facebook Live, by the way. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> ah, oh, you look so pretty. After our concert, we just talked about life, you know, just talked about where we were both at at that time, about her and Moody and about how she was going to be moving out. She was nervous, but it gave her something to look forward to. When she brought me home, I didn't know that that was going to be the last time I ever saw her. A week later, on November 18th, Ashley meets her mom, Christine, to begin packing up her things from the home she shares with Moody. Her and Moody are moving out of their apartment, so we put everything into storage for her. Ashley asks her mom to come with her at the end of the month when she'll sign the lease on a new apartment. Ashley was beyond ecstatic about getting this apartment. Talking to her, you would have thought she was winning a million dollars. You would have thought she was decorating a mansion the way she would talk. And that was the last time I saw Ashley. On Wednesday, November 28th, the night before Ashley is scheduled to sign her lease, she goes out for the evening. 
Ashley checks in with her mom, but does not say where she is headed or who she is meeting. The last time I got a message from Ashley was at 5.55. And she said that she was almost to her destination. That's not Ashley. Ashley would say, you know... I'm at Walmart. Or... Yeah, wherever she was, mm-hmm. but she said destination. The morning of the lease signing comes, and Christine does not hear from Ashley. They sent her a message first thing in the morning. I'm like, where are you? Where are you? And all day. I'm not getting anything. It, it, there was something wrong. I called Ashley's work, but nobody has heard from her. And that's when it starts hitting me. Where is she? And it just snowballs from there. You're not answering. I am worried. You don't tell people where you are going. You don't. You don't have to tell me, but damn it, you need to tell someone. I need to know you're okay. You need to contact someone and let somebody know. November 30th, in the morning, I called the police to file a missing persons report. Officers talked to some people that were close to Ashley to see if they knew where she was or or could account for her whereabouts, and they could not. When we get a missing person report, and the person happens to be 31 years old, that that could mean a number of things. Maybe the person doesn't want to be found or is just away with friends and and having a good time. So it's generally not assigned to a full-blown investigation at that point. But Ashley's loved ones have a sinking feeling something is wrong. And they know that this is all happening in the wake of a big breakup. When she broke up with Moody, I think, you know, Moody didn't really want it. When somebody goes missing, especially young women, a partner or a potential partner, somebody that they know and that they trust or that they're potentially intimate with, tends to be the person that might harm them. As the day goes on and you're not hearing anything, panic starts to set in. So I called Moody and I asked him, where is she? Investigators catch a glimpse of Ashley's final moments. You can see him kind of turn around. He's pointing at something. He's talking to somebody. And then eventually Ashley joins him. And race to determine who she was with. He seemed to be a person prone to violence and unpredictable. Before the unthinkable happens. I tell the dispatcher, I need officers fast. I see a lot of death. This one stands out in my career as a horrific scene. November 30th, 2018. 31-year-old Ashley Young has not contacted her family in more than 24 hours. At midnight, I'm flipping out a little bit. By 7 o'clock in the morning, I'm in full mode panic. And I remember I called my supervisor. And I said, I'm not going to be in today. And she said, okay, is there anything I can do? The first words out of my mouth were pray. Just needed to pray. Ashley's family is worried her disappearance might have something to do with her recent breakup with her boyfriend, Moody. Prior to them actually breaking up, Ashley told me there had been a couple arguments and their relationship did hit a couple walls. 
But Moody appears genuinely distraught about Ashley's disappearance. He starts panicking because he don't know where Ashley is, and that's why he got with us in the middle of the night. Moody was right there with us looking for her. And he was so hurt and so upset. Moody loved her, and I knew she loved him, too. When Moody provides police with information about his whereabouts for the past several days, he is cleared by law enforcement. Christine makes a plea to Ashley's friends. I put out on Facebook that I haven't heard from her, can't get in contact with her. I asked her friends, acquaintances, anybody, if you have seen her, contact me. Meanwhile, Christine uncovers a possible lead on Facebook. Christine goes into her daughter's Facebook activity and is able to see that she's been communicating with a person named Jared Chance in recent days. Jared Chance is an old friend of Ashley's. Six years ago, they spent a lot of time together hanging out as friends. There might have been an attraction there, you know, but Ashley was not that type because she was in that relationship with Moody. And then Jared disappeared. So she never heard from him in six years. During our trip to Detroit to go to the concert, she had said that he was really reaching out. They started talking more and more, and then Jared called her because he needed a ride home. And so she went and helped him. And so then he wanted to take her out as a thank you. In the wake of her breakup with Moody, Ashley has just begun to dip her toes into the dating pool. She was texting me about having feelings for Jared, just asking for advice on what do you think I should say? Should I say this or should I say that? And yeah, I just want to get it perfect. Ashley leaves another friend a voicemail expressing her excitement about Jared. Jared is so hard to read, but I know that if he was my boyfriend and he actually, like, was in love with me, I know he would be amazing. I cannot wait to see him on Wednesday. Wednesday, November 28th, the night Ashley vanished. Once I found out that Ashley was with Jared, I asked if anybody had his phone number. One of Ashley's friends does. So Christine calls Jared to see if he can help. She asks him, do you know where my daughter is? Do you have any information? And he said that they were actually together the previous night, but that she went home and that he has no idea what happened to her. Jared said that Ashley and him had been to Mulligan's Bar in East Town, Grand Rapids. And then I told Christine, we need to go to Grand Rapids. We need to go see where she was. Follow her footsteps. Grand Rapids is about an hour north of Kalamazoo, where Ashley lives. Grand Rapids is a college town. It's a huge city. It's the second largest city in the state of Michigan. Ashley's moms arrive at Mulligan's on November 30th. So I talked with the bartender at Mulligan's and we were able to go look at the security footage. You could see Jared and Ashley wandering around the bar. She ordered a drink. She's smiling. She's laughing. She's being Ashley. I wanted to pull her off the screen and take her home. But the footage doesn't show her leaving the bar. Despair and desperation start sinking in for Ashley's loved ones. It was like time stood still, you know, in a sense, and you just had that, that pit in your stomach. We knew something was wrong. And we just went driving around Grand Rapids looking for Ashley. We walked down the railroad tracks. We poked around ponds, lakes. There was nothing. It's almost like you think you're dreaming, but you're not dreaming. 
everything was a wild goose chase. Friday, November 30th, 2018. Christine Young has had no luck finding her missing daughter, Ashley. But she has discovered that Ashley was last seen at a bar with a friend named Jared Chance on the night she disappeared. She takes what she's learned to the Grand Rapids police. Christine Young asked for the, the police department to help, but if it was Jared, we need, we need evidence, you know? You can develop theories, but theories won't get you a search warrant. Theories won't get you an arrest warrant. You need, you need evidence. You need facts. Frustrated, Christine reaches out again to Jared. He previously told her that he and Ashley went their separate ways after going to the bar on November 28th. She begs him to share anything else he can remember. And that's when he told me about Demetrius... Jared says Ashley was talking to a guy he knows named Demetrius Taylor that night at the bar. The relentless mothers track him down. When we got there, he's like, I don't know, Ashley. I don't know your daughter at all. And he opened up his phone and showed the text messages where Jared said, hey, Ashley's mom's going to call you, and you have to say that Ashley was just with you, and you guys were just together. And Christine was reading it, and she's like, no. Dimitri said, you can copy it, give it to the police, whatever you need to do. Even though we didn't know him, we kind of hit it off. And because he was compassionate and was understanding what Christine was going through. And he said, he has kids. He understands. After that point, I think everybody kind of knew that we just didn't get the whole story from Jared. It just became more and more plain that Jared was trying to to stall. I had always told her that I didn't think that he was good for her. I didn't think that he necessarily had the best intentions for her or that he knew how to be a good man. Christine and Dana decide to head to Jared's apartment to confront him face to face. That same afternoon, a resident of downtown Grand Rapids makes a shocking discovery. I was living in Grand Rapids on Franklin Street. Two apartments downstairs, single father, custody of my 12-year-old daughter. My girlfriend had been complaining about a bad smell in the apartment for, you know, about a day and a half. And me, I'm thinking, there's dead mice in the walls or something. But the smell was definitely strong. My cat runs in the basement. So I had to go to retrieve my cat. So I opened the door so the light from the day could shine down into the basement so I could see. As I go down the stairs, I see the tarp on the floor. That's when I see blood. I make it to the top of the stairs at full speed. I yell at my girlfriend, call the cops, call the cops. I've been having a real bad smell lately. So I just went in the basement, opened the basement door, and there's a tarp, and it was I'm not the smartest man in the world, but there's blood, there's trouble. I'm thinking I'm a father, like I have a daughter at home. Like I need officers fast. Please, 
somebody right now. Because I don't, I don't know what it is, but it looks like blood is leaking from it. And I'm not going to touch this type of anything like that. GRPD showed up at that address not too long afterwards. Like most police agencies, you know, they all have body cameras on now. And so we were able to watch the officers go into the basement. And it's, it's like watching a horror movie because they're going through this darkened basement that's lit by flashlights. They look at the tarp and see something that they will never ever forget. On December 2nd, 2018, Grand Rapids police officers make a horrific discovery in the basement of an apartment building. I'm standing in the driveway like, oh, shit. this can't be, you know what I'm saying? Like, this, this is not real, this is not real, this is not, this is not happening. The police asked me, can they search my house? Of course, sir, like, please. Among the officers who respond is the detective who Christine has asked for help in her search for Ashley. By the time I got there, there were officers in front and back of the house making sure that nobody um, went in or, or came out without us knowing it. Okay, the tarp is laying on stairs, about the last three stairs. I then entered the house, went down into the basement where this tarp was found. So this tarp was quite large and it had a zipper on it. I unzipped the bag and we then discovered the body of a woman with uh, the arms and legs and head missing. I remember thinking, who are we dealing with here? You know, what kind of animal does this to a person? Police have now discovered this horrendous scene and they know that they have a body but all of the identifying features have been removed so they don't know who is dead and they don't know who potentially killed them there's multiple occupants in this multi-dwelling residence Police on the door! Come to the door! who do you think they found living in the upstairs apartment Jared was secured in a police car and transported to our headquarters. It didn't take long to realize that this, this case was going to be different than most. I see a lot of death all methods and this one it stands out in my career as, as as a horrific scene I went up the stairs looking for the rest of the body when I entered the second level apartment there was a large brown stain on the kitchen floor I look in the bathroom and noted there wasn't a shower curtain in the bathtub I remember looking at one of the floor vents and I pulled the grate off and then I saw cartridges, small caliber. A lot of different areas that we found tested positive for blood. Clearly something bad happened and somebody tried to cover it up. As we made our way out of the apartment, back to the stairwell, we found a box 
about midway on the landing. So I start to open the box and I see a black trash bag. I open the bag and there were human limbs inside that bag. There are two legs and there are two arms and there are no hands and there are no feet. At that very moment, Ashley's family is headed to Jared's to confront him for sending them on a wild goose chase with Demetrius Taylor. They have no idea that it is now a crime scene. We pulled up at 6 o'clock and the yellow tape was around Jared's house. I was screaming at the officer that was stopping us from going any further. And I'm telling him, my stepdaughter's up there. My stepdaughter was with Jared. And he said, ma'am, I can't tell you anything. And I said, well, her mom's right over there. And he, the only thing he could say is go tell mom not to leave. And I'm like, no, it can't be. It, it's not Ashley, it's not. I didn't want to believe it. The police explained that they were doing DNA because it was that bad. They couldn't recognize her. Without the confirmation from DNA, we certainly couldn't say these remains belong to Ashley. But it was pretty clear to everybody involved that uh, the remains were very likely to be, unfortunately, Ashley's. I just have to prove it. Police now have the one person who can explain the gruesome scene in their custody. So Jared was kept in our county jail, but the investigation doesn't stop. We found two spent 22 casings in the apartment, which led me to believe that this was a shooting. We'd also found out that Jared Chance did have a 22 caliber pistol that was now missing. So at this point, we have a, a body found in Jared Chance's house. At the same time, we have Jared Chance present in the house. We certainly would like to, to hear from Jared what happened. Grand Rapids police have discovered female remains in the building where Jared Chance lives. They need Jared to tell them if this is Ashley Young. Jared Chance was taken into custody and transported to our headquarters. So I asked Detective Fan and Detective Bray to attempt an interview with them. You need to make just for a sec? We'll get your cuffs off, okay? okay. All right. Want me to take them off the cuffs? Or... Uh, yeah, you're going to be decent with us? Yeah. All right. Initially, Jared was somewhat talkative. You guys stay busy, don't you? Huh? You guys stay busy, don't you? Pretty much. He wasn't rude. Almost seemed like it was just another day. Didn't really ask why he was there. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jared. Uh, I just recommend me to just ask for the advice of the attorney. Because I don't really know what the hell's going on. So mm -hmm. I don't want to, like, sit here and talk about shit that may, may incriminate me or whatever in any kind of way. Because I don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I just don't want to say nothing right now. He exercised his right to counsel at that point and, and didn't tell us anything. So on the evening of December 2nd, Jared is charged with the mutilation of a body and concealing a crime. Our next step in our investigation is to utilize, you know, every avenue we have for a timeline. We had phone records placing them together, 28th into the 29th, and then seems... The activity stopped, and her, her phone, um, in essence, just disappeared. But Ashley had been seen at a pub with Jared Chance here in the city. By the time we found out that they were at Mulligan's, that video is gone. You know, local businesses don't keep all their video forever, but 
because of Christine's doggedness, she had already seen the video. Hoping for additional evidence to solidify the case against Jared, investigators comb through more footage from businesses near Mulligan's. So we did obtain video from a local business called the Pita House. And it's dated November 29th, and it's approximately 1.30 in the morning. It shows Jared walking in front of the, the business. There he goes right now, just kind of strolling along. And then, you know, a few seconds later, that's Ashley there. And once again, we see Jared walk into screen, and then eventually Ashley joins him. We know clearly from the video that Ashley is still alive on the early morning hours of the 29th. It was crucial in, in trying to pinpoint what her final moments were. We also found really crucial video at a party store, Miss Tracy's, which was in essence right across the street from Jared's house. Inside the store, we see Jared Chance purchasing alcohol and ammonia, a cleaning product. We suspected that some extensive cleaning had been attempted in the apartment, and then we just so happened to have Jared buying cleaning supplies that day. And then on one of the videos, uh, we see that he's approaching, and we see him put something into the garbage bin right outside the front of the business. And of course, that's of interest to us. And that led us to then the dumpster behind the party store, which happened to have Ashley's purse in it. Based on the evidence, we were fairly confident that uh, Jared killed Ashley in the wee hours of the 29th. But this theory remains speculation until authorities can officially confirm the body parts found belong to Ashley. Waiting for the DNA test was one of the worst times of my life. I didn't want to believe and neither did Chris. If this isn't her, then she's still out there somewhere. She's missing. So we're still looking. Ultimately, they came back a few days later and said that all of the evidence that had any sort of blood tissue on it belonged to Ashley Young. So we knew that definitively then that, that Ashley Young had, had died. I never thought anyone could bring that much pain to so many people. I never heard, never thought about murder. You always see it on TV. And it's never going to happen now. But it does. I just want to know where the rest of Ashley is. I want to bring her home. Investigators are also determined to find the rest of Ashley's body to help them build a stronger case against Jared. They hope his cell phone data might lead them to her. Using cell phone records, we knew that uh, Jared had made his way out to Holland, which is a little city uh, just west of Grand Rapids. And that's where Jared's parents live. Our interest in the parents was they were with Jared on the same day that, that we made the discovery of the body. The fact that Jared wasn't talking to us, we hoped maybe the parents would, would lead us, uh, you know, to some of the answers that we were looking for. And so we go and take a trip to Holland. James Chance, Jared's father, answered the door. I explained to him that we had a search warrant, that this was non-negotiable, that uh, his house was going to be searched. I spent the next several hours with the Chance family while our detectives and other officers and forensic techs processed and searched their house. 
His father was a retired police officer, and he made a comment about, I'm glad I'm not investigating this case, that this is a tough case. And I start thinking, how do you know it's a tough case? What do you know about this? December 5th, 2018. Investigators are at Jared Chance's family home in Holland, Michigan. They want to know if his parents have any information about Ashley Young's murder. But they opted not to speak about specifics without consulting an attorney. While Jared's parents are tight-lipped, the scene inside their home speaks volumes. A sawzall was found in that house. There was tissue observed on the blade. In the Honda CRV, which was in the garage, we found a small trace of blood. They also located a bloody shower curtain that also was connected to Jared's apartment in Grand Rapids. The evidence throughout the home convinces investigators that Jared's parents helped him cover up his crimes. It was a shocking revelation for all of us. Within three to four hours, Jared Chance is charged with murder, and his parents are charged with being accessories after the fact in the mutilation of a body. We learned that they drove to Grand Rapids on Saturday, December 1st, Jared loaded some boxes into their Honda. Jared got in the car, and they proceeded then to return to Holland. One of the main goals is trying to locate Ashley's head, hands, and feet. I appealed to them as parents, you know, trying to get them to, to consider how Ashley's family was feeling. And essentially, I got very little. Jared seemed to be a person prone to violence and unpredictable. He seemed to be a troubled young man that had a lot of various problems and couldn't hold a job, didn't have very close connections to friends and family. Ashley wants to fix people, and I think that that's what she saw in Jared. She was the one person who actually wanted to believe in him and push him to do better. Ashley believed there's always good in everyone. But what she didn't realize is there's not always good in everyone. What changed? What flipped? From the minute that they were at that bar and having the night that they had to what he did to her in a basement. The burning question what happened in the final moments between Ashley and Jared remains pure speculation. I think he made a pass at her. That was my first instinct. And she rejected him. And then I think he killed her. The trial begins today for a man accused of murdering and dismembering a Kalamazoo County woman. Whether it was showing these horrific photos to the jury, listening to the forensic techs who had to open up this box and find Ashley's limbs throughout the entire process. Jared showed zero emotion the entire time. Now the trial is in the hands of the jury. The defendant is under count one guilty of second degree murder under count two guilty of tampering with evidence ultimately the jury convicted jared chance of second degree murder tampering with evidence of mutilating a body of uh, failure to report a death every single charge that was before them they convicted him of jared chance is sentenced to 100 to 200 years when the sentencing was handed down her mother got in front of this entire courtroom. I cry seven days a week. Seven! Dear Chance, I hate you. I want to rip you limb from limb. 
Jared's parents now must face justice. Barbara Chance decides to take a plea, and she actually only serves 45 days in jail. But the father, James, decides to take it to trial. James Chance is acquitted of perjury, but is convicted of an accessory after the fact. So he gets a year of probation, including one month of jail. If they would tell us where the rest of Ashley is, we could bring her home. They owe that to her family. They owe that to her friends. Unfortunately, I don't believe that they ever will. I don't think they'll give us that. So anyways, have a good day. I really am going to go get ready for class now. And sorry for talking a lot, but that's just me. If you were lucky enough to have Ashley in your life and she considered you a friend, you know the loss. You know what you lost. That's mom. It's her going into the house. She walks in. That was it. Mom is missing. This beautiful, blonde, very young and vivacious woman. Everybody was starting to reach out, and like nobody had heard from her. I tried to message her to her, I tried to call her on Messenger. Police had to look at those facts and say she could just be off the grid right now. We don't have a crime scene, we don't have an obvious crime. There's no body, there's no murder weapon. Right here, right here. Yeah, yeah. It's going to look like he's dragging something. What the hell did we just watch? Billings, Montana, 2018. The fiercely independent city on the edge of the Rocky Mountains is in the middle of an economic boom. It's here that 49-year-old Laura Johnson has come to experience her own independence after years of raising her children. Yep. Yeah, that's that's probably the best picture of my mom. All I know is my mom got some 80s hair going on and my dad actually has a full set of hair. Seeing all of us as an actual family... Holy smokes. Laura grew up in Vancouver, Washington, and met her future husband, Howard, there when she was 18. By the time my mom was 23, she had five boys. She loved the fact that she was a mother. She always told us, I would never regret having all of you kids. She was extremely loving, and she was amazingly funny as well, and she gets that from... Her dad, who's just a jokester at every turn. She was a wonderful mom. Always helped with everything. Always treated everybody like their family. My dad worked the regular nine to five. Mom stayed at home, raised the kids. She was very nurturing. She did everything. Every night she'd cook dinner. And for the amount of people that we had, I felt like it was a lot, but she made it look always easy, so... She always made it a deal to have a good meal. Big old feast. My entire career has been in food service and that's mostly due to the fact that I grew up cooking in the kitchen with my mom. But in 2012, their children grown and out of the house. Laura and her husband Howard separate and Laura moves to the Las Vegas, Nevada area. I definitely think she wanted to find her own sense of happiness. 
you know, a woman in her 40s having that for the first time, it's got to be empowering, you know what I mean? So she did tell me that she had joined a dating app. And it isn't long before Laura meets someone she really likes. His name is Greg Green. Greg was one of the people who she was matched with. He worked in Vegas right there. They went out on a couple of dates, and then it went to the point where she was living with him in Nevada. Although she now lives a thousand miles away from her family in Vancouver, Washington, Laura keeps in regular touch with her sons. My mom's never really good about keeping a cell phone. So our main points of communication were Facebook. She was consistently on Facebook. Like, you can click on Messenger, and her little thing would be green. In July of 2018, Greg Green gets a job in Billings, Montana. Laura follows him there in August, and soon after, she lands a job at a Papa John's restaurant. After her first day at work, Laura calls her son, Stephen. I remember the last time that I talked to her on the phone was when she was driving home. It was literally just, you know, talk to each other, see how life's going, have some laughs. But it's not until you look back, you wish you did more with your time, you know. On September 18th, 2018, Laura's sons become concerned that she has stopped communicating with them. My older brother, Howard Jr., he spoke to my mom every day. He called me and said, hey, have you guys heard from mom? And I haven't heard from her. I looked on Facebook. It said that she hadn't been active for a couple days. So then I called Stephen. I was like, hey, have you talked to mom? Jonathan called me on the 18th. The fact that Jonathan had even called me in the first place was a huge red flag. Because if there was a way to get a hold of her, he totally could have, you know what I mean? But now he's at the point to where he's like, I need help. I called my mom, and every time the phone was straight to voicemail, I've tried to message her to her, I've tried to call her on Messenger, I've tried to call a job, and the job's just like, yeah, she hasn't shown up for work since September 13th. Like, all of this, and I'm coming up with nothing. Nobody had heard from her. I called Greg. He picked up. He says, came home from work on the 13th, and she was gone, all of her stuff's gone, all of it. I don't know anything. He doesn't know where she is. September 24th, 2018. Laura's sons have been trying to reach her for six days. So then I started calling the police department out there. We asked the Billings, Montana Police Department to do welfare checks. Officers went to Ms. Johnson's residence to attempt to make contact and speak with her. The gate was locked. There was two large dogs in the yard. They weren't friendly. The house was quiet, and they weren't able to make any contact. <laughs> Officers went to Ms. Johnson's work and was advised that her last day of work was on the 13th, and she had not been to work since then. Detectives tracked down her boyfriend, Greg. When officers spoke with Gregory, he told him that on the 13th he had gone to work. And when he returned that day, he found that she was gone and she had packed her two red suitcases that she had brought with her and, and had left. The majority of people that contact police departments looking for their loved ones or wanting welfare checks done, um, those people are, are found uh, eventually. You know, maybe they did go on a vacation and they didn't tell somebody. I think a lot of people in, with the fast-paced life that we have, people want to take a break, they want to disconnect from life, and that can be 
it's something you have to take into consideration when looking for people. What the law enforcement officers told me was, you are telling us that she's missing. We're not saying you're wrong, but we don't have enough information to say that you're right. The fact that it was a grown woman, people believe that if they aren't being found, it's because they don't want to be found. And anybody who knows my mom in this situation know that that's fundamentally not true. So the sense of like, something's happened became very real. It's been 13 days since anyone has had any contact with Laura and her family is getting anxious. I posted a picture of my mom and he said, we have not heard from my mom. And just to explain the situation, a lot of people commented on there. The post was getting a ton of shares. I thought that the whole thing was just strange. The fact that, you know, her sons haven't heard from her. We don't know where she is. She hasn't showed up to her job yet. She's not responding to text messages. The first thing that I do when I see something like that is I do reach out to law enforcement. September 27th of 2018, I did receive a call from one of the local reporters regarding a Facebook post involving Laura Johnson. So the next thing I did after I got off the phone was started to research the case. While we haven't reached the level that there was a crime committed, things were starting to fall in place that not everything was right. Investigators find baffling clues in Laura's disappearance. There was a recent phone ping from Washington that showed that the phone had been there on September 26th. And learn of a troubling past. She had a prior addiction and she could just be off the grid right now. I'm not just gonna sit here. The next logical step was to go to Montana. September 27th, 2018. Laura Johnson's family has not heard from her in two weeks. Her boyfriend, Greg Green, tells police he hasn't seen her since September 13th, which was also the last day she was at work. At this point, it's still unknown where she's at, unknown if there's foul play involved. We just had not gotten any information conclusive one way or the other. Police ask Laura's son, Stephen, if there is anything going on in her life they should know about. Stephen tells them that years before, she was injured and that she became addicted to prescription painkillers. But at the time of her disappearance, she was getting treatment and doing well. There was a feeling that potentially she may have relapsed due to her addiction. Police had to look at those facts and say... Well, she does have a history of use. She had a prior addiction, and she could just be off the grid right now. Detectives reach out to the clinic where Laura has been going for treatment. The clinic advised me that she had been there every single day for three weeks prior to the 13th. If Laura has relapsed, Detectives know she could be in hiding somewhere. They go back to Greg Green, hoping he can help focus the search. But he doesn't have anything to add to his previous statement that Laura had moved out on September 13th, and he hasn't seen her since. He was quite cooperative. He consented to a search of his home. Officers didn't locate any items that they thought were suspicious at that time. And... Gregory had allowed them to look through his phone, which he showed them some messages that he had sent to Laura after she had left. We don't have an obvious crime. We just know that she's been missing. Investigators subpoena Laura's phone records, and when the data comes in, there's a glimmer of hope that Laura is alive and well. There was a 
recent phone ping from Washington that showed that the phone had been there on September 26th. Detectives wonder if Laura went back to her hometown of Vancouver, Washington, where her sons and ex-husband live. From an investigative standpoint, it made sense because that's where some of her support network would be. Sergeant Billings called and said, I got some great news for you. I was like, oh, she did show up in town. I got excited. Laura's sons immediately start searching all over Vancouver for her. Me and my wife drove around for two hours to every business that was open, showing pictures of my mom, asking if anybody had seen her. So I was like, if she's in town, she's obviously would be at one of the hotels for sure. None of the hotels are like, nope, haven't seen her, haven't seen her. Nobody's seen her. Not a single person. Laura's sons are disappointed that there is no sign of her. Then they get disturbing news. The investigators made a mistake when tracking Laura's phone. When they pinged my mom's phone, they pinged the last incoming call. And it was my dad. And it was on his birthday, because he spoke to my mom every year on his birthday. He knew everything that was going on. And he's like, well, it's my birthday, so hopefully she answers. Laura never answered that call. And detectives realized that she was never in Vancouver. It's been 18 days since Laura Johnson disappeared, and her son Stephen decides he has to take action. Being all the way in Washington and realizing that I wasn't going to get an answer, that was the next logical step was to go to Montana. I was like, I'm not just going to sit here. I couldn't let him go alone. They said to themselves, we're going to just get in the car and we're going to drive 14 hours over to Billings and we're just going to go look for her ourselves. So the first place that we went was the police station. And what they tell us is, as long as I didn't break the law, I could do anything. I had inclinations about who the person Greg was. And none of that ever sat right with me. Stephen calls Greg looking for more details about the last time he saw his mother. He picked up. It was him. You know, who are you? What is this? Hangs up the phone. So I went to his house. I was yelling my mom's name. I'm yelling Laura. I'm yelling mom. I think that she's in there. And then that's when he lets the dogs out. So I go up to the dogs and they're loud but they're not dangerous at all so i just bent down and started petting the dog you know and that's when he came out of the trailer and lights a cigarette and he's you know can i help you and i tell him i was like i'm steven johnson like laura was my mother i believe you know where she is and i would like you to tell me and he's like no i came home and she was gone he's very cocky and he's just standing there smoking his cigarette so i told him I believe you know where my mother is. I will be the one to put you behind bars, and I'll be the end of you. So he tells me to leave, and he calls the cops on me. October 1st, 2018. Stephen Johnson has driven from his home in Vancouver, Washington, to Billings, Montana, to try to find his missing mother, Laura. After a disturbing encounter with Laura's boyfriend, Greg Green, Stephen's next step is to create flyers and post them all over Billings. When we went anywhere, we handed these out. So we went to Greg's work and we put them all over his window at work. And then he tore them all off. We were like texting, we're like, all right, has anybody heard? Anybody heard? Like, we want to know, like, what's going on? We woke up 8 o'clock every single morning with a place to go to, an idea in mind, with somebody to talk to, to just try to find something. So at the end of every day, I'm calling my brothers, telling them, here's what we did. 
Here's who we talked to. It was very frustrating because this is like what you see on TV. I never thought in my life I would ever go through it. One of the hardest things for me was dealing with frustrations with the family, understanding their concerns, understanding their desire to have, you know, swift justice. We can't just go to Mr. Green's residence and knock the door in and do a search without a warrant. We've got proper legal procedure. And at that time, we were, we were lacking enough information to use the search warrant process in order to further develop Ms. Johnson's case. It was frustrating not being able to get a real reaction. So it just felt like our duty to prove it. We've talked to everybody who we can. We've been to the doctor's office. We've been to the Salvation Army. Everything comes up empty. We had gone through every single dead end. We had been through all of Greg's neighbors with no answer, with no solution. We were nowhere closer on day five than we were on day one. And the last thing before we leave town that we figure we can do is go knock on the neighbors' houses again. As they are knocking on the door of the neighbor across the street from Greg, Stephen sees something he hadn't noticed before. I basically stopped and I said, hey, I think we found something. There is a camera at the one place that we're interested in. It points right at the driveway of where Greg and Laura lived. Stephen and Casey had talked to the owner a few days before. Now, they ring his doorbell again, hoping to get access to the footage. And the first thing he says is, do you want to see? And I said, what are you talking about? And he goes, I have my camera footage pulled up because you were asking me about your mom. He invites me in, and for the next, like, 35 minutes, I'm just on his floor looking at a bunch of video. So the first thing we pull up is September 13th, the last day she went to work. And then Casey's recording it on her phone. You could uh, speed it up. So we're going through, going through. So we're watching the camera footage. And then this is where it gets very interesting. It's him. Right here. Keep playing. What happens is... Greg gets home first. Greg gets home and parks his truck and goes inside. And 35 minutes later... Right here. Oh! My mom gets home. Right there. Oh, so, oh, okay. it's mom. Blonde hair. It is 7.07 on September 13th. That looks That's to see her. You. It's her going into the house. We were told time and time again that Greg's story is, I came home and she was gone. I came home and she was gone. She had taken all of her stuff and it was gone. So we got him. He was like, but, well, where is she? So we're watching the footage. Day turns to night. What time is it? Right now. 11, 27, 10, 27? 10, 27. There he is. The headlamp. Headlamp on. We see Greg throughout the entire night. Right here, right here. Yeah, yeah. It's going to look like he's dragging something. Back. Just moving. Going back and forth between the house.
That's when we call the detectives, like, you need to come see this. Stephen Johnson has discovered home security footage of his missing mother, Laura. It shows her at the house she shared with Greg Green after the time Greg told police she had left. Realizing the importance of the discovery, he calls the police. Approximately quarter to 11 that night, I go to that neighbor's house and we watch the footage in question. We then start uh, viewing the, the video in greater detail. And it was definitely uh, very concerning. The detective's trained eye spots something that Stephen and Casey missed. The footage shows uh, the area of the driveway where Laura Johnson is observed coming home that evening. And she's exiting the vehicle and walking toward the trailer. Gregory, he's also seen going back into the garage and coming out with two red-colored suitcases in that vehicle as well. The same two red suitcases that Greg told officers that Laura had taken with her when she moved out. And then, the detective sees something that changes the investigation from a missing persons case to something much more disturbing. And you can see him walking out with that large, heavy object. That's zoomed in to show that area of the vehicle where he puts uh, what we believe is Laura's body into the vehicle. And then ultimately, he's observed putting a shovel in the back of the pickup bed. before he leaves that evening, just after 7 p.m. We believe that more than likely that is her body, but we need a lot more evidence uh, to prove that at this point. That was kind of a gut-wrenching feeling to know that you just observed somebody's last moments. What the hell did we just watch? The only logical answer is, you know, Greg, I did my mother's life that night. And finally dawns on me, like after all of this, that I'll probably never get to see my mom again. Is that I'll never get another goodbye. I'll never, I'll never get that closure. I'll never get the last I love you. I'll never get any of it. It's just gone. But unless police can prove that it is Laura's body on the video, they don't have a crime. On October 5th, three weeks since Laura was last seen, Billings police ask Greg to come into the station for questioning. Gregory told us what he had initially told officers. He told us that on the 13th, when he got home that, that evening, she was gone and her two red suitcases were gone. In that video, it shows Greg pulling those suitcases out of the house and packing them up in his truck. He seemed very surprised when we told him that there was video. And then he decided that he didn't want to talk to us anymore. We informed him that he was not going to be allowed to go back to his home. Uh, we believe that that was a crime scene at this point. The vehicle he drove to the police department was impounded at that point. We have now crossed into full-on criminal investigation. We do believe a crime has committed. 
we had probable cause at that point um, to seek a search warrant for his residence. But we didn't have enough information to that point to make an arrest. We executed that search warrant that evening and began to process uh, the trailer where Gregory and Laura lived. One of the first things that we noted was the strong odor of new carpet smell. In the back room of Gregory's home, it was obvious that the carpet had been replaced very recently, and that was suspicious to us. But because police find no proof that Laura is dead, they have to release Greg. At this point, we still don't have a body. We still haven't located Ms. Johnson. There was not enough to arrest Mr. Green for the disappearance of Ms. Johnson. It's a crushing blow to the family. After them basically telling him, hey, we know you're lying, they let him go. The entire family was, like, really upset because you have all this video, but you don't arrest him. Why? There's a lot of frustration, but I would say it was mainly based around, like, this guy did all of this, and we could just see right through him. We work closely with the county attorney's office and trying to determine, you know, what more we need to get to to get to that point to make an arrest. I had to remain focused on what needed to be done to build a case against him. While the forensics team examines Greg's seized work truck, detectives have a strategy to keep an eye on Greg. One of the last things we did when we searched the residence is we placed a tracker on his vehicle. We believe that he did more than likely take Laura's body to some location to bury her. We placed the tracker on with, with the hope of he might go back out to the location. The tracker is placed on Greg's personal car, the same one that Laura is seen driving on surveillance video on September 13th. On October 5th, Hours after his interview with detectives, Greg Green starts to move. On approximately 10 p.m. that evening, his vehicle started to move towards the interstate, heading west outside of Billings. So we began to follow him. He drove straight through the night, and we realized that he was leaving the state. October 5th, 2018, Greg Green is the prime suspect in the presumed murder of Laura Johnson. Lacking evidence of a crime, detectives have to let Greg walk free. But they have placed a tracker on his car, and he appears to be leaving Billings, Montana in a hurry. His vehicle started to move towards the interstate and uh, headed west outside of Billings. Detectives track Greg as he drives for 16 hours across five states to his old hometown in Henderson, Nevada. If you're being interviewed by police about the whereabouts of your ex-girlfriend and you just hightail it out of town, it's not a good look. We're coordinating with law enforcement where he was at. They knew that we were tracking him. They would do drive-bys, make sure that we knew his whereabouts. Meanwhile, Billings police continue the search for evidence to arrest Greg. Using his cell phone data, they track Greg's movements during the night of September 13th, which leads them to the local Walmart. We were able to locate footage of him going to Walmart that evening. And when he went through the self-checkout, we did see a very distinct abrasion on his face, which we thought was very suspicious at that point. Then, 
Another crucial piece of evidence emerges from the forensic search of Greg's impounded work truck. I noticed that the vehicle was very clean. It had been washed recently. So after two days processing that vehicle for biological material, taking swabs from various locations on the seat, we found three very, very small one to two millimeter stains that appeared to be blood. That evidence came back from the crime lab, and sure enough, it was Laura's blood. The totality of all of the evidence that we had located, it, including the blood on the door of that truck, and together with video footage showing him carrying out what we believed was Laura's body, at that point there was enough evidence to arrest him. Greg. I remember you. You remember us? Sorry. So you know why we're here? Um, I imagine so, yes. Okay. So, uh, uh, something you changed or something like this? Or? Well, we have a warrant for your arrest for neighbor homicide. So that's what's changed. That's why you're here and have us. Okay. And you'll be expected back to Dylan's. Huh. For... For deliberate homicide. Deliberate homicide. Deliberate homicide. Do you want to tell us what happened with her when she came home that night and what you did with her? That's that's your decision. I'm not going to trust you. That's what I want to know. I do everything that uh, I, that I know already. Okay. Well, we both know that's not true. So if, the, if you don't want to talk to me, we'll end up there. Okay. After being held for seven months in a Nevada jail, Greg is extradited to Billings. More than a year later, in February 2020, his trial is set to begin. But without Laura Johnson's body, a conviction is far from a sure thing. We had a theory of what we believed happened, but we just didn't have a body. This is the very first case that I've ever had that involves a no-body homicide arrest. When you're trying to convict somebody of a deliberate homicide and you don't have a, a body to go along with that, it can be very stressful. What is your evidence? Can you really make it stick? Drug surveillance video and murder. Testimony begins in the trial of a Billings man accused of killing Laura Johnson. We sat right behind him the entire time. I was not happy at all. He was not taking anything seriously. I don't know if he was just in disbelief, like this is really happening, so he just kind of like went numb to it. He maintained his innocence the entire time. Even though there was video being played in the courtroom of him carrying what appeared to be Laura's body out of his house. The evidence in this case will show you the defendant took great lengths to cover up his murder of his girlfriend, Laura. Prosecutors present jurors with a possible motive for the brutal murder. Laura was about to permanently end her rocky relationship with Greg. One of the things we did learn from the trial was she had moved into a separate bedroom. And she was saving money to try to leave. He acted like he was at home sitting on his couch. And yeah, he didn't care whatsoever. He thought he was like at home watching Netflix or something. He knew exactly where the cameras were from news media. There was a moment where he turned around, looked into the lens of our camera and gave a little smile. Greg's behavior at the trial only adds to the heartbreak felt by Laura's family. That if this situation didn't happen, like I could have had my mom back. She would have been living in my town. She would have been. She would have been here. It's not fair. How will this trial pan out? 
without evidence of Laura Johnson's body. This case has had so many unanswered questions. It's had so much heartache with it. And there's no body, there's no murder weapon, there's no evidence that shows he actually killed her. Two years after Laura Johnson's final moments were captured by a home security camera, a jury in Billings, Montana is set to decide whether her boyfriend, Greg Green, is guilty of murder. This trial lasted, what, two weeks? Mm -hmm. Monday through Friday, eight hours a day. Didn't leave that city hall building for two weeks, basically. That footage was the, the critical piece in the investigation and in the trial. It was a piece of evidence that the, the jury actually got to take back with them to deliberations, to view. Can't escape the silent witness. Can't escape that video surveillance. Any person with common sense to see all the evidence, and especially the video, would know he was guilty. I just got home the day before. And Stephen called and said, hey, they, can't, they have a verdict already. We're heading back. The jury was out maybe two hours. You don't know. You, you put 12 people in a room and make a decision and hope it's the right one. To the charge delivered homicide. Guilty. Ultimately, he was convicted of deliberate homicide. And he received a sentence of 100 years in the Montana State Prison. In my 16-year career, uh, this is the first case I've been involved in that went from a welfare check to a missing persons to a homicide without a body to a even prosecution of a homicide without a body. And the fact that the contribution that we had was as impactful as it was, that's where the bittersweet part comes, you know? Had to extend ourselves that much. Go through something you could never prepare yourself for. Exactly. If he didn't do that, then we would still be searching. One of the key pivotal moments here was the persistence from family. And then Ms. Johnson's son coming to Billings and locating the surveillance footage. And I can only speculate if that video had not been located or recovered, I'm not sure where we would be now. Today, Stephen and his brothers are focused on keeping their mother's memory alive. My mom was a part of my life every single day. I, uh, I got married last year to my beautiful wife, Casey, here. Uh, we had our daughter, Eliza, and Eliza's middle name is my mother's name. So her name is Eliza Laura Johnson. A big part of how my mom was as an everyday mother is the ways that I've been able to cope with her loss. So it, making the meals that she made, having the family dinners, you know, bringing her into my life in those little ways to keep her alive. That's, that's what I do. She's there every time I make dinner, you know? The only thing I have that I can hear her voice now is April 2018. She called me, but I was at work, and she left me a voicemail to tell me happy birthday. That's the only thing I have to, like, hear her voice. We still have the fact that we don't know where my mother lies to this day. That we have not been able to bring her home. We haven't had the sense of closure for peace. There's been no funeral. There's been no memorial. There's been nothing. If there's anything that anybody can tell us, if there's anything that sticks out, if there's 
a piece of property you own, if there's something you can do, if there's something you've seen, to just, you know, to please come forward. I'm hoping this outcome that people come forward with actual real information and it helps us find her and bring her home. There's laughing, she's smiling, she's beautiful. They're buying alcohol for a date night at home. Very playful, very happy. They notice a half-naked body lying in the road. There was a laceration to the head and there was a significant pool of blood. And there was a bottle of alcohol on scene. I saw that it was uncorked, it was next to her. Was this murder or was this an accident? Cat belonged to a members only type of website service. She was a beautiful woman. And one of the ways that she made money was selling pictures of herself. It's one of the dangers of having a following on the internet. There are bad followers out there. She was a great mother. They focus on her risky endeavors online. And she was so much more than that. Looking at the video, everything looks great. It's sad to think that these are her final moments. January 2018. For Kat and Jeff West, the quiet Birmingham, Alabama suburb of Calera is the perfect place to raise a family. Kat was a very special person, and her energy was magnetic. Everybody was drawn to her. Jeff was a very nice guy. He was very approachable and super sweet. It seemed like a, a match made in heaven. Kat and Jeff have been together for nearly 15 years, and it's clear why Jeff fell for his wife. Kat was beautiful inside and out. She captivated the audience the minute she walked in the door. She had a banging body, her makeup done all the time. Kat was hot. <laughs> Kat and I met as teenagers. She had this little um, Pontiac Fiero that I thought was really cool. She would pick me up and, and we would spend time with friends and go to the beach. We just did what most suburban kids do. After high school, Kat surprises her friends when she takes a job in a club working as an exotic dancer. She bought a condo in Tampa when she was 21 and began a relationship that she told me took her down a dark road and she developed some bad habits and it was not a healthy relationship the way she described it. But when Kat turns 29, a chance encounter turns her life around. She meets Jeff West, a recruiter for the Army, and it's love at first sight. They met in 2004 at a Super Bowl party. She just described him as a really sweet guy, and he was the person that she had sort of been waiting for and the answer to her dreams and her knight in shining armor. Her life changed. With Jeff in her life, Kat stops dancing. And after four months of dating, the couple marries. A year later in 2005, the couple welcomes a baby girl, Logan, into the family. Kat was a great mom. Yeah, she adored her daughter. She 
would always rant about how Jeff was a great dad. They were very family oriented and you could see it. In 2014, Kat and Jeff settled down in the small town of Calera, Alabama. They moved to Alabama because both of their families lived there and they wanted to be close to the grandparents. They bought a big house. Jeff retired out of the military and they had a great family life. Jeff finds work as a campus police officer at a local college, while Kat is a stay-at-home mom. But the fun-loving couple still finds time to let loose. She was the life of the party. That was her role. She loved it. Friends love to follow Kat's life through her fun posts on social media. It seemed like she was in a really good spot. She was very happy in the place that she always wanted to be. January 12th, 2018. Kat and Jeff are heading out for a date night. They dropped their daughter off at her grandparents' house, and they were going to have a good night. Kat's parents and her daughter have no idea that this is the last time they will see her. In the early morning hours of January 13th, 2018, a 911 call comes into the Calera Police Department. Around 5 a.m., a young woman living in the neighborhood uh, noticed a half-naked body lying in the road. The neighbor calls 911, and Calera Police Department rushes officers to the scene. When they got there, they saw a female body and nothing but a pink bra. The body is half in the road and half in the grass. There was blood around her, and there was a bottle of absinthe right next to her as well. Here in Alabama, the coroner's job is to go out on the scene, determine what the cause and manner of death is. She was a blonde female, um, very petite, maybe 30s, 40s there was a laceration to the head. And there was a significant pool of blood. Also, looking around scene, we noticed that there was a cell phone on scene. There was a bottle of alcohol on scene. We saw that it was uncorked. It was next to her. But the bottle was kind of leaning up against the phone at an odd angle. So that was odd to all of us. The bottle and cell phone are collected for testing as investigators look for evidence to help identify the victim and explain what happened to her. There's a myriad of scenarios that are playing through your head. At face value, this looks like it was just an accident. Maybe they had walked down the street and they were hit by a car or fell, hit their head. Was she pushed down? Was this done by somebody? As police examine the scene, A local resident tells officers they recognize the woman as their neighbor, Cat West, and points out her home right across the street. As detectives approach the home, they see that the door is open. Jeff West appears in the doorway. The detective could tell that he was visibly shaken. The investigators gently begin to interview the distraught man. He had started to kind of detail their previous date night. They go to dinner, and after, they didn't want the night to end, so they stopped at the liquor store, bought a bottle of absinthe, and went home and continued the night. She's changed. She's in something more comfortable. He's taken photos of her, and it seemed like the night was going well for the two of them. Jeff tells the investigators that he and Kat returned home around 9 p.m., and he had shared some photos from their fun night together on social media, including one of the bottle of absinthe they were drinking. He told police officers that he was tired, his leg was hurting, he went to bed in the downstairs bedroom around 10.30 p.m., and he also told them that his wife wasn't ready to put an end to the night at that time. 
Jeff tells the detectives much of the night is muddled in his memory. But it was the sound of the police sirens that woke him up, right before they came up to his door. After a couple of drinks, sometimes you don't remember, or if you do remember, everything isn't so clear. At this point, you really have no leads as to really what happened, who did it, and and where to even start. The question then has to be asked, was this murder or was this an accident? Jeff was the last person with her, so I mean, at that point, it makes him the first suspect. Detectives discover images of Cat West's final moments. This is the last time we saw Cat West alive. She looks smiley, cheek to cheek. The two of them are walking through the store. And the more they learn about their victim, the more complex the case becomes. She had 50,000 followers across social media accounts. Cat was too friendly on occasion. Cat was too welcoming. And I feel that probably could have backfired at some point. Detectives trying to unravel how Cat West died are interviewing her husband, Jeff, who tells them his memories of the previous night are hazy. After a night of drinking, he says he went to bed while Kat continued to party. This couple went to have dinner and drinks. They went to a liquor store. They went home to drink more. So I think it's more than fair to say alcohol had an influence in what recounting these events looked like. But as the interview goes on, Jeff does admit he remembers one other thing about the night. Jeff told officers that he was a little aggravated that she was looking at her phone too much. He told police officers that he felt like she was not paying attention to him. He threw her phone outside. And he went to bed. He was off. Jeff told officers she could have went outside, fell as she was trying to get her phone, or it wasn't unlike her to go outside in the middle of the night after drinking and jump on the trampoline. If she was jumping on the trampoline, which was in their yard, we would have seen a trail of blood. The police department had to rule that out. Maybe she got too intoxicated and walked outside, tripped and fell and hit her head, and you know nobody knew about it. They were both intoxicated. Maybe he had passed out before she had come back. He didn't remember what had happened. He woke up uh, with the dogs barking and his door open. The cops were at his door. I was shocked. He was worried about his daughter and getting life moving forward without his wife, her mom, Kat, being in the picture. The coroner's report comes in the next day, January 14th. It doesn't give the detectives the clarity they are hoping for. Forensics came back with the autopsy report, and it was determined that she died from blunt force trauma to the head. So the skull was cracked. Someone struck her in the head, and she ultimately died from brain swallowing. Looking at her laceration, it was about two, two and a half inches long. It was on the side of her head, just a few inches from the top of the head. Where she had the laceration, it's almost impossible to get by falling down. And there was nothing out there for her to hit her head on. So we knew that did not happen. We know some kind of tool was used that was blunt, did not have a sharp edge on it. And the main thing that was in the vicinity that could have caused that was the bottle of alcohol. There was a bottle of absinthe next to her that had a small chip in the base of it. So the liquor bottle is very heavy. If you strike someone with that type of glass, it will not break. And there was some blood smears on the bottle that were cat's blood. I think someone struck her with the bottle, 
So you think, what happened? Did somebody come in? Was this just a stranger in the night or she, by happenstance, end up with somebody on the street? The only fingerprints analysts find on the liquor bottle are either Kat's or Jeff's. But detectives know that doesn't prove anything because the couple shared the bottle earlier in the evening. Although the coroner's report doesn't point to Jeff West as a suspect, the detectives feel it doesn't rule him out either. The last person she was seen with was her husband. So you start to think, well, is there something that we missed? You know, is there something that we could press further on with him? So the investigators start digging deeper into Jeff's story about the night his wife died. They visit the liquor store where the couple stopped before returning home. You go to the liquor store, ask the employee that was on shift that night if they had seen them in there, pull security footage to verify. But when investigators view the footage, what they find is the opposite of a couple on the verge of a violent conflict. You can see Cat West. This is the last time we saw Cat West alive. The two of them are walking through the store. She looks smiley, cheek to cheek. Jeff West slaps her butt. It honestly leaves you with more questions than it does answer any of what might have happened. Detectives suspect Cat West's husband, Jeff, may be involved in her mysterious death but have no proof. They're examining Jeff's story about what the couple did earlier on the night Kat died and have discovered surveillance video from the liquor store he says the couple stopped in. The video includes the final images of Kat alive. Looking at the video, everything looks great. The two of them just wrapped up a date night, seemingly having a nice time, flirting with each other in the liquor store. It was funny when I saw it, he pats her butt. And I kind of chuckled because that's who he was. <laughs> he loved his wife, he loved the way she looked. <laughs> There's laughing, she's smiling, she's beautiful, and they're buying alcohol for a date night at home. Everything appears to be normal, very playful, very happy. And it's sad to think that these are her final moments. This final moment of her in the liquor store, she, that's who they were, that's, that's who they are. They're just, they're good people and she didn't deserve it. The footage seems to corroborate Jeff's story that he and Kat are simply enjoying a fun night out. Detectives don't believe the images show him acting like a husband who will kill his wife in a few hours. It looks like his entire story checked out and that they did indeed have a, a fun night together and, and that was it. There's no reason we should list him as a suspect. Kat's friends are equally convinced that whatever happened to her, Jeff isn't to blame. He never seemed overbearing. Like, I never heard them argue or anything. They just had an interesting relationship, but it seemed like in a really good way. I don't think there's a harmful bone in Jeff West's body. I've never seen Jeff be an angry person. I've never seen him act in anger. Although the coroner could not determine the exact cause and manner of Kat's death, Investigators suspect foul play, and with Jeff now considered less likely to have been involved, the search is on for other potential suspects. She has a, a laceration to the head from blunt force trauma, so you were thinking there is something nefarious about this death. The other side of the investigation that you have to look at is who is Cat West. You try to find any information you can on her. Is she cheating on her husband? Does she have any enemies? We've got to look at all sides of this. When investigators dig into Kat's internet history, they learn that she has a massive online presence. Kat had a lot of friends online. 
You know, I keep my friends on Facebook, just my friends that I know. Kat had thousands of friends on Facebook because anybody that would add her, she would add. And I think that's what kept Kat on her phone all the time, was that she was always talking to people online. When Kat got hundreds of likes for a photo, that's a dopamine boost. But the investigation also leads to a concerning discovery about Kat's online life. She wasn't only active on mainstream social media sites. One of the things that came out was that Kat belonged to a members-only type of website service, that she would take pictures of herself in lingerie, uh, maybe even provocative type poses, and was selling pictures of herself. She had over 50,000 followers on her page who loved to purchase photos of her. She would model herself as, as Marilyn Monroe and uh, went by the name Kitty Cat West. She had told me that she sold her photos online and she showed me a couple of them. I was shocked to see what I saw. They were revealing in nature. They showed her butt, her boobs, cute poses, lingerie, and people would ask for more and they would have to pay some more money to get more. She was open about it and Jeff knew it. The adult stuff that she was doing online, it surprised me at first, but I think it probably filled a void for her or it gave her some validation that she might have been craving. Detectives realized that any one of Kat's 50,000 plus followers could have taken an online fantasy about Kat too far. As a woman, when you are beautiful and you are showcasing yourself to these people, having a lot of followers like that, some of them may, may think they know you. Some of them might try to find where you live or where you frequent. There are bad followers out there. It's one of the dangers of having a following on the internet. Kat was too friendly on occasion. Kat was too welcoming. I think Kat could have gotten herself into some sticky situations. And I feel that probably could have backfired at some point. There were questionable comments that raised an eyebrow for investigators. Did one of these followers go rogue and, and stalk her, come and find her? You have to take that into account. The investigation into the death of Cat West has taken an alarming turn after investigators discover her photos on an adult website with thousands of subscribers, any one of them a potential suspect. You see this blonde bombshell. She is in her 40s. She is a hot mom, and she had 50,000 followers across social media accounts. News of Kat's online activities clouds the investigation in another way, as it quickly grabs headlines in her suburban Alabama home. It took off so quickly, it, before we could even fathom it. You know, it's on all these news outlets. I was a digital content producer at a news station in Birmingham at the time. In Alabama, it's conservative, it's the Bible Belt. A woman like Kat West, being a cam girl or an online selling nude photos, that is not your typical mother in this town. And it raised a lot of eyebrows. There was a lot of victim blaming that she somehow contributed to her death. Her background of what she did was frowned upon. Obviously, her drinking was frowned upon. The community, they don't want to believe that this happens in Calera. Just because she took those beautiful pictures, she was much more than that. They don't talk about how she was a great mother. They focus on her online stuff, her, her risky 
endeavors online. <laughs> and she was so much more than that. Investigators begin digging into Kat's vast pool of online followers, searching for anyone who might raise a red flag. I've seen some of the comments online. They're not necessarily the nicest sounding people. I can't imagine what was in her inbox. Like, I'm sure it was pretty graphic. Calera Police Department did a fantastic job and took their time to go back to her website to find out who was subscribing and literally check out every one of her subscribers. You've got 50,000 followers to sift through and try to see if there's any case to be made on that. But after two weeks of digging, investigators cannot find anyone among her online subscribers who might have been in the area the night Cat died. Those people were ultimately ruled out and not considered suspects in this case. Detectives are back to square one with no suspects. As they review their case, given the new information about Kat's online site, they can't help but wonder whether they dismissed her husband, Jeff, too quickly. Kat West taking nude photos and selling them online also raises the question, how did her husband feel? But investigators discover that once again, there's nothing to support suspicion of Jeff. She wasn't living a double life. Jeff? I mean, he was very aware of it. I mean, even her parents knew about it. His parents knew about it. So it wasn't a secret. There had to be someone behind the camera taking those photos. And sure enough, it was Jeff. He's in adoration of a cat and posting how hot she is. And, and, and so at that point, you're just, you're really not considering him as a suspect as much as you were before. He didn't seem to mind at all. In fact, at one point, Jeff told me, that's how she makes her money and makes herself feel good. That's fine. And from there, you just go back to the drawing board, right? When detectives go back to their case file, they discover something curious something they believe deserves a closer look. The Wests had an ADT security system at their home, and that provided some telling information. It had a log of when their front door opened and closed. So by Jeff's story, he went to bed at 10.30 that night, but when they checked his security, you know, that's where they started finding out that the timelines of the events that he described, they weren't exactly matching up. His ADT system showed the front door opened at 1.51 a.m. and stayed open for more than four hours past that point. The times in which that front door had opened was also past the time Jeff West said he went to sleep. It could have been his wife, it could have been Jeff, but we don't know that. Let's not forget that it's January and the door is wide open. If you slept even a few hours with the door wide open, your home is cold. You wake up and you're like, oh my gosh, the door is open. I need to figure out why is my door open. The confusing data from the house security system causes investigators to once again take a look at Jeff West. And their new suspicions lead to a warrant for his cell phone records. He told police officers he went to bed at 10.30, but his phone logged that he had been moving around past the time he told officers he went to bed. According to the fitness history on his phone, a short time after 11 p.m., he had taken 18 steps. The data from the phone and the door opening and closing were not exactly matching what he was telling them. And some of the text messages with his wife found on Jeff's phone are troubling to investigators. Looking at some of the text, it was obviously not a relationship that was perfect. She felt that he wanted to leave her. There were multiple texts with this back and forth of, should we split up, should we stay together? 
she's telling him, I know you're scared to tell me if you don't want to be with me, but it's hurting me by lying. There were some fundamental issues wrong in the relationship. And the text just kind of highlighted those. All the way leading up to her death, they had these texts going on. When investigators learn that Jeff is apparently not telling the truth about the timeline of his movements that night, they start to question everything else he has told them. There are still a lot of holes and gaps into what really happened that night. But at that point, there was no other person of interest. There was no other suspect. It was Jeff West and Jeff West only that was being looked at as the murderer of his wife. Investigators in Calera, Alabama, have found evidence that contradicts Jeff West's story about his actions on the night his wife, Kat, died. After ruling him out earlier, the detectives are now again looking at him as a potential suspect. Jeff had said that they had gone out on date night. They had come back home. They had taken pictures for her social media. They were in an argument about the phone because she was on her phone quite a bit. And he had gone to sleep and didn't know where she was. He said his leg was hurting from a former injury he sustained in the Army, and so he went to bed, and uh, Kat stayed up from there. Detectives know the data from the West's home alarm system and from the fitness tracker app on Jeff's phone appear to contradict that. But Jeff is sticking with his original story. He told police officers, how does anybody know the exact moment they went to bed? What's the difference between 10.30 and 11.15? If alcohol was involved, if someone asks you to the minute when you went to bed last night, are you able to have an accurate answer? With Jeff now firmly in their sights, detectives go back and review all of the evidence. That includes obtaining the original 911 call from the neighbor who found Kat's body. When they listen to the full recording, they discover it contains a critical clue. When she called 911, she asked, had anybody already called this in? Because across the street, she could see a man pacing in his home and the door was wide open. This statement contradicts what Jeff West told police officers, and that was that he was awoken to the sound of sirens, which were not there yet. Jeff's whole story seems to be falling apart. Next, the investigators conduct a careful re-examination of the evidence found near Kat's body they realize there may be an explanation for some of the unusual things they noticed there. We did see a cell phone on scene. There was a bottle of alcohol on scene. And it is weird that the bottle was kind of leaning up against the phone at an odd angle. You would think if you were intoxicated that the bottle would be just randomly down on the ground, not propped on the phone. If Jeff was involved in his wife's death, they wonder, could he have staged the scene trying to make it look like an accident? But it's when they re-examine Jeff's fingerprints on the absinthe bottle, previously dismissed because he was known to have held it earlier in the night, that the loudest alarms are set off. The location of the fingerprints on the bottle of absinthe wouldn't be if you were to just grab a bottle. They were positioned if you were holding it upside down by the neck. Detectives realize this could be because Jeff was holding the bottle of absinthe as a weapon. And they now put together a theory of what they believe happened the night Kat died. Probably Kat was on her phone and that irritated him. And Jeff threw her phone outside. And then afterwards they took pictures and she only had the bra on. And obviously something went wrong. Um, Probably her asking where my phone is. 
and she went out to find the phone. He followed her out there and things escalated. I think he initially struck her with the bottle. She fell and probably lost consciousness at the time. Um, and he walked back to the house. And as she regained some type of consciousness, she moved around in the grass and kind of pulled herself to the curb. She was in a fetal position, but probably because she was cold. She was just clothed in a pink bra, um, no other clothes. Afterwards, the investigators theorize Jeff tried to cover up his crime by staging Kat's cell phone and the bottle next to her. Obviously, there are some holes in the story, and as it progressed, the holes became bigger. So about five weeks after the cat was found on the street, Jeff was arrested for her death. Despite having only circumstantial evidence, on February 23rd, 2018, police charged Jeff West with murder. Jeff continues to insist he did not kill his wife, and many people believe he is telling the truth. Cat West's family, her parents, her friends, all sided with Jeff West. They immediately said that he didn't do it. They loved each other, and they were, had this marriage that was so beautiful. And although they argued here and there, like, that's just marriage. That's, that's what comes with it. When I first found out, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, Jeff? Jeff hit her with a bottle? I would have never pegged Jeff to be harmful in any way. I was in disbelief that Jeff would have killed Kat. The evidence is counterintuitive to what I knew about her and Jeff. Hoping to avoid a lengthy trial with an outcome they can't be certain of, prosecutors make Jeff an offer. He was offered a plea deal from the prosecution for time served plus two years probation. He turned that down. So you're turning down that for possibly spending years in prison. It made you wonder, is he really innocent? Maybe he didn't do it. Jeff West's trial for the murder of his wife, Kat, outside their Calera, Alabama home is set to begin on November 17th, 2020. Jeff was offered a plea deal where he would serve time at a lesser charge. Uh, he would get out of jail earlier, prison earlier, but he did not want to do that. He wanted to pursue a jury trial and still maintain his innocence. I was shocked when Jeff didn't take the plea deal but I understood why. If that's your story and you're sticking to it, why would you take the plea deal? Prosecutors argue that Kat's death was not an accident. That Jeff West bludgeoned her to death with an alcohol bottle following an argument. The most damning testimony that was given was the medical examiners who said that she could not have died by falling. Prosecutors present jurors with the home alarm data and information from Jeff's fitness tracker suggesting he lied about his actions on the night of Kat's death. They display the texts showing a troubled marriage. And they showed the video of Jeff and Kat purchasing the murder weapon, a bottle of absinthe. But Jeff's lawyers countered that the investigation was not able to prove that the bottle was, in fact, used to kill Kat. When Jeff West's attorneys were presenting the case to the jurors, they were saying, we don't have a murder weapon. We don't have a motive. These two were in love. It's not Jeff West. 
After a week of testimony, both sides rest their cases. When the jurors went to deliberate, I thought it could go either way. The jury's options were murder, manslaughter, or innocent. I thought that they were either going to pick one of the extremes that he killed her with intent or that he didn't at all. The jury came back after their deliberations and read their verdict. Jeff West was guilty of reckless manslaughter. Jeff wasn't necessarily planning for this to happen. They had gone out, they had gotten drunk, they had gotten disgruntled about something and, and maybe gotten into an argument. It wasn't premeditated murder, it was more of a, a, a reckless, reckless killing. To see them fall in that middle ground that he was responsible for killing her but did not intend to was interesting because that wasn't a story told by the prosecution or the defense. The defense is over here saying he didn't do it at all. The prosecution is saying he did and he meant to. The jury decided neither of those narratives held true. Jeff West was sentenced to 16 years Though Jeff West sits behind bars, for many, questions about his guilt still linger. I think Calera PD saw online double life, jealous husband, crazy guy, and he killed her. But there are lots of other avenues that could have happened that night that I don't feel were investigated well enough. I don't think justice was served in the case because I don't think it was proven beyond a reasonable doubt. But that doesn't mean he didn't do it. The thing I miss most about Kat is her glowing attitude. She was always there as a friend. <laughs> 